The Urban Design Commission requires a quorum of five members to be present and available for voting. Members of the commission may be attending remotely in compliance with the Texas Open Meetings Act. The following members are present today. Chairman Gannon Grease, Commissioner Jesse Stamper, Commissioner James Hook, Commissioner Mary Kay Hughes, Commissioner Gwyn Harper, Commissioner Steve McCune, Commissioner Aaron Thesman, Commissioner Mike Rattery, Commissioner Douglas Cooper, and Commissioner Jose Diaz. Staff present today are Lorelai Willett, Jamie D'Angelo, Rich McCracken, Anna Baker, Christopher Austria, Brian Linus, and Randy Hutchinson. Today's meeting agenda can be found online at www.fortworthtexas.gov. Speaker registration forms must have been turned in prior to the start of the meeting. Today's public hearing is being documented by video conference recording, which will be available on the city's website. To achieve a timely and orderly meeting, the UDC requests that the following rules of procedure be respected. All participants will be muted when not speaking in order to avoid any potential background noise. Each case will be called in the sequence listed on the agenda, unless otherwise directed by the chair. All ensuing dialogue shall be directed to the UDC only. After each staff presentation, the applicant and other proponents will be given a total of seven minutes to speak. Opposition may then speak for seven minutes. Continuation beyond the speaker's allotted time will be subject to the chairman's sole discretion and approval. For attendees, please remember to look directly at the webcam and not at the screen when speaking. All other meeting procedures will adhere to UDC adopted rules of procedures to the extent practicable. Following the official close of each case hearing, the UDC will remain in open session to discuss and vote upon the item in question. During this time, no further public testimony or commentary will be allowed unless directed by the chair. A closed executive session may be held with respect to the posted agenda items to enable the UDC to receive advice from legal staff. For any additional information on any case on today's agenda, you may contact the Development Services Department at 817-392-8000. Thank you for your attention. Mr. Chair, will you please call the meeting to order? I'm going to turn on my microphone. Welcome to the September meeting of the Urban Design Commission. Are there any announcements from any of the commissioners? No, I'll, I'll make mention of um, uh, a tour that's coming up at the Kimball Art Museum uh, by architects and photographers on the um, 26th of this month. There's a morning session from 9 to 11 and an evening session from 5 to 7, and it's a great opportunity to see uh, that building through the the view of an architect and photographer and to see a lot of the back of the house stuff. So uh, if you're interested in architecture and, and love that building, then please join us on the 26th. Um, you know, I don't know if they're, yeah, I think it would probably be both buildings. Yeah. Okay. Do you know what time that's going to happen? There, there's two tours. One is in the morning from 9 to 11, and the one in the evening is 5 to 7 on the 26th. <laughs> Do you need to uh, uh, RSVP for it or just show up? Yeah, I, I believe you do have to RSVP. Yeah. I think check the Kimball's website and they should have some additional information. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. All right. Staff does not have any um, announcements either. And I did want to mention that um, we did fail to include last month's meeting minutes in the docket, so we will have to postpone approval of those meeting minutes to next month, and we'll just do August and September together as a vote. Are you sure? I remember downloading them and reviewing them. They were on your docket that was emailed, but not on your tablets, so um, how does... If it was sent out and posted, then you okay. Can go ahead. Okay, then it sounds like we can. Okay. I mean, I reviewed them, so. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So I guess have all the commissioners reviewed the meeting minutes? Anybody would like to make a motion? Move to approve. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Chairman Grease, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Diaz? Aye. Commissioner Stamper? Aye. Commissioner Rattery? Aye. Commissioner Hook? Aye. Commissioner McCune? Aye. Commissioner Thesman? Aye. Commissioner Hughes? Commissioner Cooper? Aye. 
and Commissioner Harper. Aye. Motion passes 10 0. All right. I understand that um, we wanted to shift one case up to the front, the urban forestry case. Yes. At your discretion, we would like to move the um, urban forestry case up to the first item. Okay. Morning. Thank you for seeing this item first today. I appreciate it. I have a trip I'm trying to get going on, so thank you very much. Uh, today we have a case, UDC 22-070, for the Highway 157 Simple Warehouse uh, development. I'm going to get right to it. We are actually going to ask for a denial without prejudice. We are, not, uh, at, we are currently still working through the site plan, and we have not received the update. So it was hard for me to update this report from last month. Uh, we are actively searching for ways to meet the actual urban forestry requirement. So we don't know if we're actually going to need UDC in the future. Okay. But and that's that's why that's why we are where we are right now. Okay. So I can go through the project if you want to be familiar with it. No, but I think it's we've got a big agenda and we've got to get to a trip. Right. And it's it's just not ready just yet. So that's that's the request. Is if you would please uh, okay. deny all that without prejudice. Uh, any commissioners want to see any of the presentation, or are we all right with uh, opening and closing the hearing? Okay. Is there anybody here to speak in favor? I do not think so. Is there anybody here to speak against? Say again. Anybody to speak against? No. All right. And we'll close the public portion of the hearing and open it to the commission. Um, I'll make a motion to deny without prejudice. Thank you. Second. Whose second was that? Uh, James. Okay, great. Oh. We have a motion and a second. Chairman Grease, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Diaz? Aye. Commissioner Stamper? Aye. Commissioner Rattery? Aye. Commissioner Hook? Aye. Commissioner McCune? Aye. Commissioner Thesman? Aye. Commissioner Hughes? Commissioner Cooper? And Commissioner Harper? Aye. Motion passes 10 0. Thank you very much. You have a good day. Have a great trip. Good morning, Commission. Your next case is item UDC 22065. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, right now. It's up to you. I mean, you're listed as an alternate. Yeah. Uh, so, just a quick procedural thing we do have, uh, we're only required, or we're only allowed to have nine. Uh, voting members present. We have 10, so there's an opportunity for somebody to um, to leave the meeting if they'd like, or um, you can stay and then just not vote. Is there anybody who would like to elect to leave? I wouldn't mind leaving. I've got some other things I can be doing. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. You're yeah. Watching. Hey, this is the first time <laughs> this has ever happened on any commission that I've ever been on. So this is great. Well, I can remember when we had a problem, had a, had problems, even having a quorum. So this is, yes. this is welcome. This is very welcome. Good Thank you everybody have. and have a great day. Thank you. You too. Thank Take you. Take care, Commissioner McCune. All right. Okay. okay. First continued case, please. Okay. Everyone is very involved. It's great. <laughs> okay. Um, the next case, uh, UDC 22065 um, at Evans Rosedale. Um, it is a request for vacations of three unnamed alleys. The vacation is requested to support a mixed use development with retail, commercial, and multifamily development at the southeast corner of I 35 West and E Terrell Avenue. The vacation request includes three unnamed alleys, the north-south alley between I-35 and Missouri, which is approximately 1.151 acres, the north-south alley between Missouri and Evans, which is approximately 0 0.095 acres, 
and the east-west alley that runs roughly in line with Dashwood, which is 153 and a half feet long and 11 feet wide. The vacated alleys will be incorporated into a replat of the block to support the site plan for the new development. The Urban Design Commission is charged with reviewing requests for street and alley vacations. The UDC makes a recommendation to the Plan Commission, who in turn makes a recommendation to the City Council. The vacation of the unnamed alleys does not represent a significant interruption of traffic patterns and circulation and allows for redevelopment of the vacant site. The applicant intends the vacated alleys to allow for parks, parking, multifamily, and commercial spaces. The applicant is actively working with staff and near Southside Inc. on finalizing development plans. And the site will also likely need a test to assess the mix of uses and staff will review the finalized building plans in accordance with the code. The vacation is supportable because there will be little impact to existing circulation. However, the applicant should provide a public access from east to west between Missouri and Evans. Given the above, staff recommends the following motion, that the request for a recommendation to the City Plan Commission and City Council on the vacation of the three alleys be approved with a condition that a public access easement be integrated into the plan for east-west access between Evans and Missouri. This concludes the staff report. Thank you. Are there any questions of the staff before we open the case? Okay. Thank you. Um, is there anyone here to speak in favor of this case? <clears throat> Good morning, commissioners. Mike Brennan representing Near Southside Inc. and our design review committee. Um, we've been closely involved in the evolution of this project going back uh, last year to when the design was first coming together. And this connectivity between Evans and Missouri has always been, um, you know, something very important that we uh, concur with staff that that needs to, that needs to be a key part and a, and a predictable part of the ultimate plan. We feel good in supporting this request in that uh, the project does incorporate a connection between Evans and Missouri just south of the historic building that's located at the southwest corner of Terrell and Evans. So that's one, one connection there. And then with the, the improvements planned um, to Evans Plaza and the adjacent park, we have the opportunity for that second connection. Um, and so uh, we think that, uh, well, we understand that there's a, a park design process that will be closely coordinated with this effort. And so um, with that being a goal for that park design process, basically a, a, a connection just at the north end of the plaza there um, there's a parking lot there now. I think that that's still the exact design of that is still in flux. Maybe there's an opportunity to, to have a nice wide pathway that's just on the north side of that parking lot next to the building and then next to the plaza. Um, but there's plenty of room to accommodate that and um, to keep this process going, knowing how many parts it has. Um, we're, we're strongly in support of this, this waiver or recommendation to the Planning Commission. Okay. Um, you mentioned about the park design around the plaza. What, uh, who owns all of that property around the plaza? It's all city owned. Oh, okay. Um, Except so, for that portion where they're putting the parking lot. Right. So it, there's all of this is uh, it's a it's a partnership between the city's the city's economic development department and the development team. So and what is being built all is on city owned property today. Oh. Um, so the drawing of those boundaries of what is park, what is parking lot, um, that's part of this process that uh, is going to be underway soon. Okay. Yeah, I'm a little bit concerned that that's just not a very strong pedestrian connection. And then the connection up north of where the uh, existing building is doesn't have a, a sidewalk there or a crosswalk. Um, and so it it there seems should, like there should be. I don't know, um, Lorelai. Do you have a, a view? Maybe it's just shown in the site plan. Um, go back to the okay no. here. All right. So do you have a laser? Yep. So this right here is a plaza connection that is part of their plan. So that's if you've seen the renderings. It's a nice corridor with some public art and landscaping and so forth. Nice wide uh, walkway. So that's the one that I'm talking about that's already incorporated into the plan. And then doing something similar right here um, would provide 
that that nice connection that obviously with if this were all one just super block with no connections then that wouldn't be consistent with what we're trying to achieve but with those two it could be really nice okay but you're saying there is another plan that wasn't submitted with the packet that shows i think that, that well this is just showing it in plan view there's a rendering that shows exactly what that treatment would look like okay yeah we, i guess we don't have that that is well this is obviously the urban design commission is one uh part of the of the review process this has already gone to city council various council committees and the tiff board with all of those drawings as part of those approved packages so okay. it's i can say with confidence that's 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 part of a i mean the tiff deal is seven million dollars that is tied to those drawings okay all right well i guess we can take your word for that it's uh yeah there's a lot and we can provide all the documentation on that but yeah that's that's on solid ground okay all right yeah i mean i'm just a little bit concerned about that parking lot and its adjacency to the plaza and it seems like that would want to be a little bit more of a a celebrated public space and i think if that was enhanced then most pedestrians would probably use that as the through block connection and then additionally having the one on the north side of the development south of that existing building i think if it was shown and planned to be a, a nice space that could also function well if that were a condition of the approval to make sure that there's a, a strong connection here then certainly we would support that okay all right thank you is there anyone else? Thank you for coming today. Is there anyone else here to speak in favor of this application? Is there anyone here to speak against? Okay. We'll close the public portion of the hearing and open it to the commission. Well, it sounds like there are additional exhibits that are publicly available that show these two connections. And so, um, as the neighborhood association suggested, um, we could make a, a condition of the right of way vacation that those connections are, um, that there are strong connections, strong pedestrian connections, both on the south and north side of the new development. Would you want it to be noted that it should be two connections in I think that instead would be of like a condition that it's two connections instead of just one from the east to west? I think that would be very important. I think I'm generally in favor too. Uh, um, the thing that I'm struggling with is what constitutes a strong connection without seeing it. Right. But they would work with staff. I think staff could help iron that out. Yeah. And near south side as well. Yeah, so we could make that a condition to work with staff and near south side. So I, I think they they both know what what that strong connection would want to look like. Mm -hmm. Okay. Up for a Any more discussion? Not here. Okay. You got a motion? <laughs> I'll make a motion to um, approve the recommendation to city plan commission and city council to vacation uh, with the condition that the public access easement be integrated into the plan for the east and west uh, access between Evans and Missouri. And there are uh, the, the applicant and developer continue to work with near south side and staff on the connection points uh, as represented on plans that exist somewhere. Okay. And to clarify, it's two connections, two east-west connections. Two connections. Okay. I'll right. second, second the motion. Excuse Thank me. you. Yes, that's great. We have a motion and a second. Chairman Grease, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Diaz? Aye. Commissioner Stamper? Aye. Commissioner Rattery? Aye. Commissioner Hook? Aye. Commissioner Thesman? Was that an aye? Yeah. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Hughes? Aye. Commissioner Cooper? Aye. Commissioner Harper? Aye. Motion passes 9 to 0. Thank you.
Your first new case is at 2419 Westbury Street. It's the proposed Salad and Go drive through restaurant, UDC 22, um, UDC 22, it should be 082. This was the previous case number from last month. Um, as a reminder, the request was denied without prejudice and so is coming before you with a new case number. The applicant is requesting the following, a certificate of appropriateness for waivers from the Barry University form-based code for a waiver to allow vehicular access from a primary street, a waiver to reduce the minimum fenestration percentage for non-residential buildings from 50% to 5%, a waiver to exceed the 30-foot maximum blank wall space by up to four feet, and a recommendation to the Board of Adjustment to reduce the minimum height from two stories to one story. This project is an approximately 0.28 acre lot located in the southeast corner of Berry Street in McCart. The character of the street is mixed use with commercial and institutional uses on the northern side of Berry and a mix of commercial and student housing to the south along McCart. The proposed project is a drive through restaurant and this is allowed by right under the properties BUCX 6 base zoning. In the Barry University Code, new developments are required to have a minimum um, of two stories of occupiable space. The proposed project does not have two four full floors proposed. Um, the applicant is requesting a recommendation to the BOA for a variance to allow a one-story structure in this location. Um, they just don't need the second story as we've previously discussed. The project mitigates for the lack of a second story by providing a design with massing and height similar to a two-story structure um, with a very tall um, front street-facing facade, which gives the appearance of multiple stories. BUCX also requires a minimum 50% fenestration on facades facing the right-of-way for non-residential structures and requires that blank area of wall space not exceed 30 linear feet. The applicant is requesting a waiver from both of these items. Um, in order to reduce their fenestration percentage from five to down from 50 down to 5% and to increase the permissible area of blank wall space to up to 34 feet. Um, this is to reduce the visibil visibility of back of house elements like kitchen and storage that would otherwise be visible if the project was meeting transparency requirements. And previously we had discussed with them providing additional activation on the McCart facing side. So they did provide updated renderings that are showing their willingness to provide mural art on the side of the building that faces towards McCart. Finally, BUCX requires that vehicular access to new developments be provided on a side street or alley, but not along the primary frontage of the development. The current project proposes to relocate an existing curb cut along Berry Street and exit on McCart. Um, this request would typically be administrative if the curb cut was not moving, but it is, so they're asking for it as a waiver item. Um, there is an, uh, an updated exhibit, which I will have the applicant walk through, that is providing some additional information about treatment of the street at that location and how queuing would work. Overall, the proposed project at 2419 Westbury is somewhat consistent with the intent of the commercial mixed use BUCX code, which is intended to provide a variety of residential retail service and commercial uses at a variety of scales and intensities. The proposed project could also be considered an improvement over what is currently in place, which is an office building with a 40 foot setback and parking at the front of the lot, and is therefore representing a temporary activation of an important corner site um, with a site design and a building design that are more consistent with the code than what's there. Having regard to the foregoing, staff recommends the following, that the request for the following items, a certificate of appropriateness for waivers from the very university form-based code to allow vehicular access from a primary street to reduce the fenestration percentage for non-residential buildings from 50 to 5% to exceed the 30 feet of blank wall space by four feet and to recommend to the Board of Adjustment that the minimum height for the project be reduced from two stories to one story be approved subject to the following conditions, that a landscape plan be included, that additional activation be provided on the McCart facing side, and that any adjustments made to the drawings be submitted to the Development Services Department prior to the issuance of a certificate of appropriateness. This concludes the staff report. Thank you. Is there anyone here to speak in favor of this case? Hi, how are you guys doing? Thanks for y'all's time. Uh, Ryan, I'll call on the applicant. Um, I'm working with Salad and Go, I'm the civil engineer on the project. Um, 
I kind of went over last month, but I just want to, another brief in case people aren't here, weren't here to kind of describe Sal and Go. Uh, they are new to the DFW market, so it's a little um, little different to see this kind of model. Uh, this is going to be like our fourth store within the uh, city of Fort Worth. We have a couple of in the north and then some uh, one down on Summer Creek in McPherson. Um, do you mind going to the layout? Just of Yeah, the is this the correct? Uh, you can you can do the old site plan. I can talk through the old site plan first, and then kind of talk about our. Oh sure, yeah. Yeah, it's the the, the mural you have at, correct. It's just the old site plan on this. So. Okay, is this the site plan? Oh, you want? if you have the email from Aaron, I do. This, this is the um, updated one, I believe. Right. Yeah, there should have been another exhibit. It's okay. You can talk through the. Oh, show the old one. That way, I can kind of get it. Is this the one you want? Nope, that's a different. Sorry, that's a different project. Um, but that's the mural, right? I'm trying to get the overall site plan. So. Oh, okay. Do you want to zoom? Yeah, this doesn't look like it loaded. Oh, there but you go. Anyways, while she's pulling that up, I'll describe it. So um, with Salad and Go, there's no dine-in whatsoever. So no one will be parking and eating inside. Uh, the operation is going to be all employees inside. Uh, they'll basically be assembling your salad or your or your um, wrap or breakfast burrito. Uh, so no dining whatsoever. So that's the idea of a way to keep our footprint small. And that makes it very hard for us to try to put any kind of windows towards our back of house. That's all going to be your walk-in cooler, your restroom, your office, or your mechanical room in the back. Um, the orientation of the building uh, is based on the code. We have to have the building right up adjacent to the right-of-way. So in order to make our queuing and our operation work, we had to orientate it that way so that the back house is facing that, that intersection. Um, describing our just last month, we talked about possibly wrapping that side with a mural. Um, right now, the mural doesn't really reflect, it's kind of an example art for us right now. I mean, we only had, just based on proprietary reasons, we didn't want to put anything like TCU or Cowtown or anything with Fort Worth on there. Um, but that's something that we want to work with the community on uh, putting something nice there on the back of house. Um, the front, this is the updated site plan. So last month we described off of Barry going westbound, um, basically the traffic jam as far as people not having a diesel lane or some, an, a designated turn lane. So what we did is we're trying to create kind of a right in, right out only off of Barry. So anybody heading, heading westbound off of Barry Street would have to come down McCart and then utilize the McCart entrance. McCart is one way. So if they needed to go back westbound, they would have to go down McCart and then exit or pull back around to get back on Barry. Uh, so that was the idea to, um, to prevent people from parking and kind of are slowing down because I know y'all were talking about Waterburger having that issue right there. So we're trying to help prevent that by amusing westbound coming down McCart. So that helps the uh, basically the traffic circulation we described. Um, I, did, I know you did mention about the dumpster. That was just a small thing I added, to, you know, putting that door off to the side for you. I, I remember just bringing that up. So we added a little sidewalk there. We will add a door off to the side so that you can keep those doors closed unless the dump truck's coming to pick them up. Um, and the two-story I think we described last month was we have no dine-in whatsoever. So by creating that two-story would just be unutilized space. There just wouldn't work with our model on there. So we have still we still have some height to it but we're not we're not hitting that i guess it was was it 30 feet that we we're trying to or the two story you had to hit yeah i think we're at like 22 feet there um i also have um sal and go representatives here so if you all want to talk about operations or anything like that they, they're here to help answer those questions okay um i do have a couple questions so the doors that are on the mccart facing side what are those for uh those are just be for your um rooftop access for one of them the other one would be like a mechanical room Usually we have it basically fenced off, but since it is facing that intersection, we're actually enclosing it. And that example art was supposed to go all the way across the door, so we're trying to help camouflage those a little okay. bit more. Uh, so with that art, we'll, and we'll work with the city on that, trying to get um, some kind of uh, you know some kind of art that we can put there. But we plan to paint that over as well to help okay. camouflage that from the corner. Yeah, that was my question as to how often that gets accessed, and no, if it's no. a trash door, I'd just worry about no, it getting yeah. banged up and all that. Um, okay, I know um, last month Commissioner Stamper had a, a concern about the, the traffic on Barry. You want to talk to that at all? Or I guess um, let me ask one more question. 
related to that. Did you guys study any possibility of using the public alley as an access through the site, either from a cart? The public alley on the backside, which yeah, it's it's a there's a lot of the utilities through there, but really trying to get access with Waterburger, we'd have to describe. I remember y'all had mentioned that about trying to get full access with Waterburger there. We'd definitely be open to trying to get that. But I'm not sure what, what how Waterberg would feel about giving up their parking and creating that access point. Well, no, not necessarily that the people would. Oh, enter just from getting there, access towards the public, going southbound. Going southbound okay. and then using yeah. that as an exit because that, that definitely may... open to that. Yes. Okay. I mean, we're, we can our property abuts to it, so we're definitely open to having that drive access to there. But then again, it's it's a very narrow road, and it's uh, I've been, we'll just have to look at the utilities for that. But we're very open to. Yeah, I was just. There trying to think about different scenarios where if you had access off McCart and you could come in and circulate, then you could circulate back out through the, the public alley and then you wouldn't need the access on Berry Street. Well, there's no curb cut to the north onto Berry, so you'd still have to go south. You'd still have to get on McCart. You'd still right. have to make your way around, but that would just be another point of exit to the south, I guess you would say. Mm -hmm. It would most likely just be easier to get on McCart using that full access. Because there's no curb cut to the north uh, onto Barry from that public alley. Correct. I mean, that's the first waiver is, is access from a public street. That's the concern. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're trying okay. to address okay. is if, if it's possible to develop the site without having that access off of Barry, right? Because waivers are requested if there's a hardship, not just because you want it. Right. No, I fully so understand. Yeah. That's why we're trying to establish if there's a hardship here. Hardship off of, of trying to get the curb cut off of Barry, I'm following you. That any, any if, kind of if it's off. possible for you to have access off of McCart for both ingress and egress, then that's not a hardship. Okay. Okay. If you just want it off of Barry because you want it, that doesn't meet the code. All right. So that's what we're trying to figure out here. Right. I mean, I, 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 have you done studies to see how the site would work if you didn't have access off of Barry Street? The, the problem with not having access off of Barry is that if anybody heading eastbound on Barry, they miss McCart, then they miss the site completely. And yeah. it's just, and based on operations and sales, they're really needing that access for this site. And because if you miss, if you go past McCart, there's really no way to backtrack because Mark, McCart's a one way. So you'd have to go, I guess, northbound and then back and around. You'd have to go around there, or you'd have to go back another whole street to go. Well, I mean, that's true with any of those businesses along Berry Street. If you happen to miss that block, you've got to find a way to turn around. Mm -hmm. But that's why that driveway is, is pretty important to us, where we're trying to do right in, right out only to help prevent anybody uh, going yep. westbound on Berry just with the traffic. And we currently have a, a curb cut there. It's just we're relocating it. Well, yeah, it's an existing non-conforming. Right. It's not one that's there by right. All right. Um, Commissioner Stamper, did you have any thoughts on the access to Barry? I guess I, the image is somewhat small on the computer here. I'm viewing remotely, but um, it looks like there's been some sort of a triangle curb put in place along Barry, and is the intent that that would limit any westbound traffic from accessing the property at that location and and how would you communicate that yes yes uh, that that is the intent and we can't control uh, anybody going off westbound but we are open to i know we talked about last month using delineators or those plastic delineators there we're open to that, but I, I remember y'all saying that that's not something we can approve at this moment, but that's something that we'd have to talk with T TPW yep. about. Um, but we're, we're definitely open to that. And yes, Jesse, that's that's the intent is trying to create some kind of pork chop there where only right in and right out. So to almost limit people from queuing up or trying to go westbound on Barry or come in from Barry Street. Yeah, I think that's the right way to solve that problem if it's needed. But I think what we need to see is that it's a demonstrated hardship, right? Like if you cannot develop the site with only access from a cart, then that would say, okay, we'll probably need to have access from Barry Street. Okay. 
I'm just I looking at a public alley and using that as full access. I mean, based on its narrow and undeveloped towards the south. That's really I feel like that is a hardship. There's a lot of utilities there. There's a dumpster located there already for I don't know who's actually utilizing that. It's not our site for that. Uh, it's just that's the hardship I see with that alley. It's just it's not full access for really all of our traffic to be coming through or half of it to be coming right. through. But you're also showing a driveway off of McCart that has both ingress and egress, so you don't need one off of Barry. Just utilize, utilizing one driveway only. Yeah. I mean, what the plan you've showed us demonstrates that you don't have a hardship. Okay. I'm, right. I, just, I, mean, I understand you want one off of Barry Street, but it's just not allowed by the code, and we're only allowed to approve waivers if there's a hardship. Right? You've got to demonstrate to us yeah. that there's a hardship. And that, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, Matt, sure. Definitely. Yeah. Let's tell Yeah. On that, with Salad and Go, you need address or anything? Are you good? Or just the city in which you okay. reside. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think for us, I mean, the, the way I would think about it is in terms, of, and I mean, and I and I understand that they're probably non-conforming as well, but every single retail parcel along the entire street has access off of Barry. Right. The reason that we typically do it is to try and prevent congestion. You're going to end up with more backup if you end up closing off a drive driveway up top because everybody's going to now be funneling in and out and you're going to create a major congestion point down at the bottom versus if you have two ways in and out because somebody can still leave through Barry even with the right in right out diverter yeah but you're you're allowing traffic to flow more naturally i think i mean we've seen this at, across our portfolio that whenever we limit access it causes a lot more trouble i don't know how you guys look at fire either but typically we're required to provide uh, two ways in and out for for a, a fire engine so well your building's not big enough to require that yeah, here within I mean, I'm the just saying in general we typically have been asked to provide more than one way in and out both from a traffic concern as well as uh just just general use of the property so well i could also make the argument that it's confusing when you have a car entering from Barry street and you have a car entering from a cart and then they have to decide who gets in line first in the, right? in the, i mean yeah i mean i'm just saying that, any that assumes, argument you that have i've got a counter argument up. that assumes that well that assumes two people are arriving simultaneously and it yeah. also assumes that we're backing up to the point where somebody's you know having to make that decision i mean yeah, I, I think it's a pretty small use case from what we've seen, but. Okay. But you haven't demonstrated that you need to have a curb cut off of Berry Street. That's what I'm saying. I, I guess how, how would you expect us to demonstrate that? I mean, we can't. Well, I, what, I, what we're suggesting is that the difficulty is if you close off an access point, you're actually going to create more congestion. So that's why we're demonstrating multiple points of access to allow this to free flow so that you don't end up with what Whataburger has as a concern. Because they have a single point of access today, or they, actually they have two points of access today. Yeah. But everybody's concern was them backing off of, of Barry, which is the primary road. So we're, we're creating a way for, for you to get in and out on Barry and McCart to try and alleviate that concern, which is... I think the concern, though, is that you're encouraging people who are going westbound on Barry to enter the site from Barry Street. Well, th I think that's why we're proposing a, a right in, right out pork chop diverter to prevent somebody from making that left turn. I, I understand, but I think that's that's the right way to solve it. But the code still says, and it doesn't matter what Whataburger or Wendy's or anybody else has, the code says you're not allowed to have an access off a of primary street, right? So you've got to prove a hardship. What's your hardship? Uh, free flowing access of the site so that it's functional for the use. But you you have both in and out on McCart. So how can how can you say that? Because I I, I thought I did, but I'll say, say right. yeah, yeah. I, I I think it's a I think it's I a appreciate your issue. time. We, we've, yeah. We yeah. Uh, um, I think we're done with that. We've got a lot of cases today, and so I don't want to run too far over. I did want to let the commission know that we did get a letter of opposition this morning, so I'm going to read it um, since we weren't able to distribute it. It's from Mike Coffey, who is the chair of the Berry Street Initiative. Um, he writes, the Berry Street Initiative opposes UDC 22082 regarding 2419 West Berry Street. Allowing these waivers would break with the precedent of holding all construction to the Berry University form-based code. 
even the new TCU hotel was required to modify its plans in order to comply with the form based code. Barry Street Initiative has not been contacted by the developer about this variance. Thank you, Mike Coffey. So we received that today. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone else here to speak in favor of this case? Not hearing anybody. Is there anyone here to speak opposition? Nope. Okay. We'll close the public portion of the hearing and open it to the commission. And I think you guys understand my opinion, but I don't get to make motions. So I think the, the concern is just that it needs to be fully vetted and um, I don't necessarily see it as a hardship. McCart's a one way right there, right? It is a one way. This is a commissioner stamper. I guess um, my, my comments on this project are really haven't changed much from the first time it was presented. I, I guess I disagree with staff that this is um, uh, closer to the, the intended use for, and um, I can't remember the exact, exact terms they used, but I don't see it as a, as a more appropriate use of the, of the property than the current use. Um, yes, there's an office building there. You know, I think in the staff report, it was said that it was 40 feet back from, from the right of way, but part of the building abuts the right of way on, mm -hmm. you know, on, on Barry. Um, it's the parking lot portion that's set back from a cart. And I think, a a some revitalization of the facade that faces Barry and you have a much more desirable outcome than you have with this current project. Uh, that's proposed. So I, I just don't see looking at this particular fast food concept as the way I would like to see all of the future development of Barry comply with our standards and guidelines. You know, it, I just, I don't see this as the desired outcome when the standards and guidelines are put in place. Um, so I guess for, for this particular concept where there is no fenestration, um, they don't see a need to, to comply with the two story rule. We have the traffic congestion issues. I, it just seems like too heavy a lift to me. Um, that that's, that's one commissioner's opinion. Any other um, thoughts? It's commissioner Hughes. Um, I think the letter from the Berry Street Initiative uh, stating that the developer has not reached out, uh, been reached out uh, to the Berry Street Initiative, that's a very important group that goes up and down Berry Street, works with TCU. You know, the uh, statement that the Hyatt Place um, Hotel that's recently been um, I think it's caddy corner from this property or across the street. If they had to mitigate their entrance, I think more effort should be made uh, to work with the Berry Street Initiative. Thank you. Any other thoughts or comments? Can you turn into that alley from Barry right now? No. Mm -mm. No, and I, I, I don't think that would probably be possible, but I think the intent of the alley is that depending on how the circulation is managed from the cart, you could also use that as an egress point. Since it'd be one way, it's only 16 feet. But okay. It'd be, I think it'd be worth seeing a study. To come in that way. Yeah. Nope. Anybody prepared to make a motion? More discussion? I agree with Commissioner Hughes that reaching out to the Barry Street Initiative would probably help support waivers. Like Commissioner Stamper said, it's a it's a heavy lift. Um, but if there was more community support, especially from the initiative over there, then I think it would be easier. So, yeah. excellent point. If um, if we did deny, would it be so that they could come back? What's deny without prejudice? Um, I move to deny without prejudice. Okay, great. Do we have a second? 
You got a second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Chairman Grease, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Diaz. Aye. Commissioner Stamper. Aye. Commissioner Rattery. Aye. Commissioner Hook. Aye. Commissioner Thesman. Aye. Commissioner Hughes. Aye. Commissioner Cooper. Aye. And Commissioner Harper. Aye. Motion to deny the request passes 9-0. Your next case is also a previous case, which was denied without prejudice and is back before you with a new case number, UDC 22081, the townhomes at 2505 and 2509 Benbrook Boulevard. The request um, for this property is as follows, uh, a certificate of appropriateness for waivers from the Barry University form-based code to allow vehicular access from a primary street to allow street facing building length to exceed 100 feet by up to 22 feet, and a recommendation to the Board of Adjustment to reduce the minimum setback from a side street from 10 feet to 5 feet, specifically along Granbury Road. This is the subject property um, at the intersection of Ben Brook and where McCart turns into Granbury. The first waiver, which is requesting um, vehicular access from the front of the lot right at Benbrook is being requested because the conditions along Branbury are um, not uh, desirable for adding a curb cut in the rear. The second waiver, which is to reduce the side setback from Granbury or McCart um, from 10 feet to five feet um, is essentially because the conversion of these two single family lots to a townhome development creates um, a tightness of, of space at this site. So in order to maintain um, the habitable space along the frontage that they're required to have the square footages that they need to have the garages and then to have the drive aisle, they're asking to push um, the setback about the setback five feet. Um, they are providing the required street side elements, which includes a sidewalk and a landscape buffer with trees. Previously, they had um, inverted these items and the sidewalk was closer to Granbury at the UDC's request, they switched the location of these items to push the sidewalk away from the street and increase um, safety walking along Granbury for access to those units along Granbury. The last item is a request to exceed the building length. Along Granbury, the code limits the facade to 100 feet. They would like to go to up to 122 feet a previous version of this project showed a something like less than six feet um, worth of space between two buildings, essentially in that location, um, with a small area of egress. However, this separation really only provided access to the resident parking and vehicular area for the development. It wasn't um, going to support increased pedestrian circulation of non-residents um, into the development. It didn't provide any additional benefits. So they are requesting the waiver to um, extend that facade an additional 22 feet. Overall, the project um, at 2509 Benbrook Avenue is consistent with the intent of the residential attached district, which is intended to accommodate a mix of attached and detached housing ob options in a pedestrian friendly environment. Having regard to the foregoing, staff recommends the following motion that the request for the following items, a certificate of appropriateness for waivers from the very university form based code to allow vehicular access from a primary street to allow street facing building length to exceed 100 feet by 22 additional feet and to recommend to the board of adjustment that the minimum setback be reduced from 10 feet to five feet be approved. This concludes the staff report. Thank you. Is there anyone here to speak in favor of this case? Um, I am, uh, this is Wes Gustin, the architect. Can y'all hear me? Yes, yep. we can hear you. All right, just checking. Uh, yes, um, just to recap, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, we closed the gap because I, I don't remember uh, which gentleman brought it up, but it was a good point that I, I think they, you wanted us to kind of close the gap between the buildings and then, of course, flip the, the landscape and the sidewalk, which uh, we've done and, and agreed to. Um, and as far as the access, um, 
I just think, yeah, it, it kind of works better this way, um, given the, the nature of, of that alley behind there. Um, and um, that's all I got. Uh, thank you for hearing me. Uh, I don't know if my uh, my client, Centel, can speak either, but um, that's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for coming today and for making the adjustments. I think this will be a, a great project, and this is a good example of a hardship of why you wouldn't want to have access off of what would be considered a primary or why you have access off of primary street, even though I think Granbury is probably more primary street than Benbrook okay. is. Yeah. But yeah, sure. Just because of this. So yeah, I appreciate all your work. Thank you. All right. Is there anyone here to speak against? All right. We'll close the public portion of the hearing and open it to the commission. I think the um, conversation at the last hearing was, was overall positive and the, the denial was primarily to give the applicant an opportunity to make revisions at the request of, of the commission. So I'm prepared to make a motion to approve the waivers as presented. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay. James. We have a motion and a second. Chairman Grease, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Diaz? Aye. Commissioner Stamper? Aye. Commissioner Rattery? Aye. Commissioner Hook? Aye. Commissioner Thesman? Aye. Commissioner Hughes? Aye. Commissioner Cooper? Aye. And Commissioner Harper? Aye. The motion passes 9-0. Uh, Jamie, I'd like to move up cases four and five next, just because I think they're going to be a little bit more straightforward than the parking lot in the last one. So, um, so the signage case? Yeah. 22079 and 075. Can we um, do 075 first since yes. uh, I am in the room? Okay, great. Sorry. Your next case is UDC 22075. It's a project at 2403 Clinton Avenue. The applicant requests a certificate of appropriateness for a waiver from the UR Urban Residential District Development Standards for a one-family detached dwelling that requires the parking area or garage doors that face the street to be located a minimum of 20 feet behind any front wall plane of a structure facing a publicly accessible right-of-way. This is the subject property. Um, it is in the UR Urban Residential District. The lot is located directly across from the stockyards um, across Clinton. The, um, the rest of the block face along Clinton is primarily, um, this is the, the vacant lot, and then these are structures along the block that are existing single family homes and some other like maybe four or three plexes. Um, the existing conditions here have garages or have garages that are located in, towards the rear of the property um, accessed by a driveway that runs along um, the side of the property line or there's just a, a, a driveway with no accessory structure. Um, but regardless, the, the primary character here is that the um, garages in the, are in the rear. The um, property developer is proposing an 18 foot wide concrete drive um, accessed from the front of the lot that um, essentially ends in the building face. So this would not meet the requirements of the UR, which require the, the garage or parking area to be 20 feet behind um, the front wall plane. And this is within that, that front 20 feet, which is why it is not meeting the requirements. This property did previously receive a waiver for pedestrian street lights because that is not, um, the, the treatment along the street does not currently include those. So if they are um, denied, they would have to revise their plan to move that parking area elsewhere on the site. Um, in August, when staff reviewed this iteration of the design, um, here are the elevations for this project. Um, they proposed to the applicant possible solutions for the placement of the parking um, to revise the floor plan to have a garage in the back 
to shift the house to one side and provide that driveway along the side of the lot um, or to just, you know, some other treatment that relocates the parking elsewhere, or they could ask for a waiver from the Urban Design Commission, so they chose the last option. Um, given what um, staff has seen along the block, um, it really doesn't meet um, the existing character of the block, so staff is recommending that the request for the waiver um, from this development standard to locate um, your garage doors or your parking area a minimum of 20 feet behind any front wall plane for a structure facing a publicly accessible right of way um, be denied without prejudice. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone here to speak in favor of this case? No. Oh, oh. yes. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. So uh, uh, this is actually uh, the old uh, drawings for the house. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we had some new ones because we had to incorporate a uh, front garage. Uh, and then we came up with the issue that, that we had to be 20 foot uh, behind any front wall. Right. Uh, which that would push the house, I mean, the garage way in the middle of the, uh, of the uh, lot. So um, uh, we, I mean, the, the lot's rule narrow. So if we try to push, I mean, try to make the, uh, I guess, access to the back. It will be just the, the house will be too narrow. So we're trying to get uh, the waiver to, uh, you know, just keep it as is. Like I said, this, uh, I mean, it's, it's an, a rough idea how it is, but yeah, mm -hmm. we, we changed it up. We have to get a, a garage in the front. So uh, we're just trying to, like I said, this is real narrow, as y'all can see, as y'all can see. Uh, so trying to get an entrance through the, to the back, through the front, it'll be, I mean, pretty, the house will. We, yeah, we're really narrow. But the adjacent houses have done it, right? Uh, so the next, the, the house to the to the uh, side is my mom's, and we don't have, she doesn't have access as well to the back, okay. uh, through the side of it. Uh, you can see it on the pictures. Uh, yeah. uh, the, is the, uh, is the, the right one. Yeah, we don't, they doesn't have uh, access to the back. It's just uh, the parking on the on the front, which is the other one to the right. Yeah, the smaller oh, one. I don't have that. Well, I could put yeah. the street view for that. So, is there alley access on the back? There is in the back, uh, which uh, all everybody pretty much on the backs, uh, the street on the back uses. Uh, oh, okay. So, I mean, there there's an access back through there. Oh, okay. Well, I mean that that proves you don't have a hardship. Okay. So, I mean, it's just a matter of uh, uh, us. Uh, how can I put it? I guess we draw the house and get the garage through the back, or how would it how would it uh, yep. be? Yeah, exactly. That's approaching. that's just part of the zoning requirements. That's part of the code, and so so if it's changed to the back, uh, then it would be fine uh, with what we're trying to do. Then yeah, uh, to have the parking. Oh, okay. Well, no, you can't have any parking in the front. There's exactly. no driveways in the exactly. front. But if you have the parking in the back, then that that meets the code. Or or uh, make the house narrower and get access through the front. Right. Yeah. It looks like that's what some other properties did is it, they probably it, just squeezed it. That one, it is, that's what it's very done. narrow. Yeah. It's very, very narrow. So the house will be like uh, 26 foot, you know, from, from the inside, from wall to wall as it is. If we, if we make an entrance to, to, uh, to have access through the front. Uh, it, I mean, so. you could squeeze it down. I mean, you already have five feet as the required setback. You only need to go another three parking spaces are only eight feet wide. Eight feet. Oh, okay. So, okay. So with, with eight foot access to, towards the back or changing the garage to the back side, would that yes. uh, apply? Because we and we were thinking it would be a 10 foot that would have to leave going to the back. Uh, I mean, it's, it's going to be real narrow as it is anyways, but. Yeah, uh, T 10 foot is definitely preferable. Yeah. But you could get away with eight. If eight foot, to. okay. Because we have to have the five foot, uh, you know, that yeah, on setback the on the other side as well. So, yep. okay. Does your pavement need to be in that? Out of the setback, I can't remember. Uh, on, on the ten, on the five foot, uh, I don't. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't, I don't think. I don't think does. does it. I don't no. believe it does. Yeah. Typically, it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. So even in the UR district, they're subject to a five foot side yard setback, to where they couldn't completely have like have a zero lot line to push. I will check on that. Forward. I think because they're a single family home, they're being treated like that style of development. Um, I will look into whether or not you can squeeze over a little squeeze, further. Squeeze so yeah. Down. Yeah. I mean, that will probably require a, a firewall on that side. And that's what they, they uh, told us with a okay. prior as well. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, but I don't think they'll let you go closer than three. It just looks like if you're pushing it towards that large White House, they have a driveway that has exactly. some good separation. Yeah. This is a Commissioner Hook. Would they allow a uh, shared driveway with the White House to the left? Uh, mm -hmm. Adding to that driveway to make it wider? That they have to coordinate with that property owner mm -hmm. for that easement, but mm -hmm. that's a possibility. You could technically oh, okay. pave over. Yeah, that's that. another way to do it. Like if there's a few feet there between that existing house, which I think you said was your mother's and the yes. and the property mm -hmm. line, mm -hmm. then that'll also get you a little bit more driveway width there. If you oh, okay. To pave oh, okay. Yeah, because that's that's her lot as well. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. A couple good options there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for coming in. All right. Uh, anyone here to speak in opposition? Mm -hmm. Nope. Okay. We'll close the public portion of the hearing and open it to the commission. I think the recommendation is to deny without or just be denied. Uh, and it sounds like the applicant's got some options that they can investigate. Yeah. And I'll speak at once. I'll yeah. make a motion to deny the, uh, the waiver request. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Chairman Grease, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Diaz? Aye. Commissioner Stamper? Aye. Sorry, one more time, Commissioner Stamper? Aye. Commissioner Rattery? Aye. Commissioner Hook? Aye. Commissioner Thesman? Aye. Can you uh, turn your camera on? Yeah, sorry. It's okay. Aye. Commissioner Hughes? Aye. Commissioner Cooper? Aye. And Commissioner Harper? Aye. Motion passes 9 0. Okay, your next case is uh, item number UDC 22079 at 1008th Avenue. The applicant is proposing an approximately 49 square foot vertical sign on the south wall of the structure. The lease space for the business is located on the first floor of the east side of the building. The sign consists of, uh, consists of a one in, of one inch deep flush mounted letters. The size and material of the sign is allowed under the near south side design standards and guidelines. The applicant is requesting a waiver from the near south side design standards and guidelines to allow a sign on an elevation that does not contain a public entrance. Staff in near south side Inc. have worked with the applicant to achieve a design that attracts attention from Rosedale and relays that the business is located on the first floor. Due to the location of the business at the southeast corner of the building, which is the closest unit in relation to the proposed signage, staff believes the location of the sign is supportable. Given the above, staff recommends the following motion, that the request for a certificate of appropriateness for a waiver from the near south side design st uh, standards and design guidelines be approved. This concludes the staff report. Thank you. Um, is there anyone here to speak in favor of this case? My name is Mike Gary. I'm with Giant Sign. We're the sign contractor for this uh, tenant, uh, Boca 31. Um, we were also the sign contractor for um, Buckingham Donuts. That was their previous and some of the other tenants at this building uh, that have now uh, left. So um, the building doesn't really have a lot of sign space. Uh, or this tenant doesn't have a lot of sign space being the bottom tenant on the southeast uh, side of the building. They, they are mostly windows and doors there, so they don't have a lot of sign ban. Uh, for them to be able to put signage there. And um, we originally had proposed doing a horizontal sign, but staff had suggested that we tailor the sign uh, to be closer to the entrance. And thus we came, uh, we came forward with this vertical placement uh, per their suggestion. Okay. Um, so I, I now have a question just from my own curiosity. Why did Funky Town Donuts put their sign, their blade sign on that side of the building instead of perpendicular to 8th Avenue? That was a question that we were kind of unsure about as well. Okay. Uh, I think uh, previous 
we weren't the sign contractor for putting that sign up previously. Okay. We did the one down here in downtown, um, but we did kind of remove it for them. Um, I think the code was different at that point and has been updated okay. uh, since then. Well, the reason I ask is, have you guys looked at the option of doing a blade sign on that 8th Street side? It's unfortunately cost prohibitive for this tenant uh, to do that. A blade sign would be upwards of fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, okay. um, which is about 13000 more than they're willing to pay for a sign. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me ask, because I, I, I understand the, the economic hardship on this one, and it is a very small lease space, and so probably doesn't warrant uh, such an expensive sign. Um, is it possible to break the sign into two parts if you had the Boca 31 on the building, but maybe the Latin street food or something became like a shingle sign that came off the side somewhere near the door to help clearly identify that that door is the entrance? Or are you planning on doing any graphics on the door like Funky Town did? Yeah, there is a possibility of doing uh, just a vinyl that you know pretty okay. much states their name uh, on the, the door or window a portion. Um, you know, uh, facing eastward, uh, that that is an option. Um, the idea of doing, let's say, a blade sign, a pedestrian sign, as you're, I think you're alluding to, uh, our problem with that is we would definitely have to keep it up a little higher. But um, because there's pedestrian traffic underneath, we need to maintain clearance levels yep. uh, from ground grade to bottom of the sign. Um, so it okay. is it is something that we didn't think about or or talk about um, doing. Okay. And then I guess if a blade sign was allowed, what would be the allowable area for that versus what's being proposed with the Boca 31? I would have to double check that because this is a special zoned area. It's not general business rules for this okay. property. So I, I don't have that. But this is still part of the near Southside District, Mike. Yes. Okay. Do you happen to know any of that off the top of your head? Okay. That's All where right. uh, Savan Steiner was always very helpful to us. Yeah. No, she she could calculate that within. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, my my concern is just it's it's a giant sign. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, it is under. I mean, based on general business rules, it does meet the ten percent rule of you know height and width. Uh, you get ten percent of of height and width for general wall signs, so it does meet that uh, and they always incorporate the first 15 feet of the of the height in that calculation so height times width uh, on that elevation times 10 percent we're still way under that um, so by by Fort Worth standards uh, it does meet the general business rules for wall signs okay but it's larger than the the adjacent uh, business the Jimmy John's uh, Jimmy John's has a different situation. They have channel letters going across their whole front facade, and I think on both elevations, if I'm not mistaken, because we had did oh, the same thing for both? the Jason Nag signs above uh, when they were there, the law office of Jason Nag. Okay. The other reason that we had a problem originally, they wanted to kind of possibly to do a light sign, but we don't have access uh, to power. Uh, originally, mm -hmm. we had put another set of signs uh, had it horizontally aligned under tattoo and vape, but because that is the second story, there was no access to power or, yep. and it was kind of confusing according to staff. So I agree. Tattoo and vape and Latin food. Yeah. <laughs> well, then it really would be one stop shop. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's my only concern is that uh, size wise, I'm just, if if a blade sign is allowed, then it would be good to know what that area, allowable area is, and see how that translates to this facade. Because I but essentially I see it as like a, a one-sided blade sign. It's unfortunate that you know they don't have the the money to get visibility from the other side, but I imagine most of the visibility is going to be from that major intersection. Yeah, again, I had the same thought, but I think if you were just to rotate the blade sign to the east side of the building, that gray projection this part of the... is probably reducing southbound visibility. So you're really just left with northbound visibility on 8th, and it's kind of what they're proposing. So yeah, I think you'd have to have a much larger blade sign that comes out from the wall to, to get that two-way visibility. Would a waiver be requested if they were oversized? 
since uh, there's not a waiver, did, should we assume that it's within the right square footage? Yeah, staff probably knows that. Yeah, they were not maxing out their square footage. Mm -hmm. uh, the code doesn't allow wall signs on um, rear sides of the building that don't have pedestrian entrances, okay. but the blade sign would be okay. It's really just wall signs that get that treatment. Okay. Oh, yeah. okay. So they're allowed that square footage? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. I believe we're well under the maximum. Okay. It just yeah. seemed like a lot to me. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> Seems big. Uh, how how is that calculated though per tenant or per building face? Because I mean, if Jimmy John's has a whole bunch of signs, there's a calculation for the area of the building face. They uh -huh. have to be under ten percent for that, and they're meeting that. And then there is an overall. There's a per tenant and a overall site as well. Okay, yeah. so the ten percent of the building face includes Jimmy John's and this one. It includes and so the ten percent would just be for this side that faces towards, I guess, Rosedale, and they are under 10% of that um, elevation with it's, their total signage area. Okay. I have a question. Is this illuminated in the evening? It is not, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Again, um, power issues, concerns, access was... Uh, so there's probably... There is no lighting on this side. No lighting. Okay. Well, definitely want to support somebody going into that spot. And, and yeah. it is supported by the near south side? Yes, ma'am. Great. All right. Uh, that's all my questions. Any other questions from the other commissioners? All right. Thank you very much for coming in. Would anybody else like to speak in favor of this case? I just said yes, so that's <laughs> that's that's the punchline. Um, Thank you. <laughs> yes, we are we're strongly supportive of the of the restaurant um, going in and succeeding. And um, I think y'all already pointed out the flaws on the the Funky Town uh, Donut sign and its orientation. Um, the waiver is specific to the location of the sign. Um, the applicants were great in um, recognizing that that horizontal composition just it didn't look right. Um, so this is a, a great outcome from our perspective. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Uh, is there anyone to speak in opposition? Okay. Um, we'll close the public portion of the hearing and open it to the commission for discussion. I'm supportive of the waiver, so if there's no discussion... I'm happy to make a motion to approve the waiver to allow the wall sign on the side of the facade without an entrance. Okay. Second. All right. We have motion and second. Motion is six, second. Chairman Grease, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Diaz? Aye. Commissioner Stamper? Aye. Commissioner Rattery? Aye. Commissioner Hook? Aye. Commissioner Thesman? May have stepped away. I guess yeah, we we'll go. Uh, Commissioner Hughes. Aye. Commissioner Cooper. Aye. Commissioner Harper. Aye. And I think motion can pass eight to zero. So, yeah. Did the chair want to do all of the cases? Uh, there are two cases left. There is the mixed yeah. use MU and then the parking. I think we can do the parking, yeah, and then the mixed use. Parking first, mixed use yep. next. Okay. Yep. Sorry, I just knew those those two would be pretty yeah. easy. We could get That's them fine. moving. Your next case is UDC 22074, uh, JPS transitional parking lots. The address is multiple locations, but primarily um, the Rosedale edition blocks C, R, and T, and the Tucker edition blocks 37 and 38. 
the applicant requests a certificate of appropriateness for waivers from the near south side development code standards and guidelines for the following items. A waiver from the requirement to provide roadside elements such as street trees, sidewalks, and pedestrian lights. A waiver to allow surface parking lot frontage to exceed 40% of the development site's total frontage length along a project's primary streets and 70% of the development site's total frontage along secondary streets. A waiver from the requirement to screen parking lots fronting a public right of way a waiver from the 40% canopy coverage requirement for parking lots, and for the proposed warehouse, a waiver from the first floor transparency requirements of 40% along a street facing facade for non-residential projects, and a waiver from the requirement to have primary pedestrian entrances along the street frontage of the building. JPS is requesting approval of waivers to allow the construction of six transitional parking lots within the near south side to support the implementation of their master plan. The chart on the next page identifies the size, parking count, and proposed conditions for each site, as well as the applicable waivers. Additional details about the existing conditions, conditions of each site were available in the application. Please note that lot E is not being considered in this request because of additional application materials needed relative to the historic and cultural zoning on the adjacent property. Um, recommended for approval by staff are all waivers for lots A and B um, on the following basis. Lots A and B are adjacent to and part of a primary campus, so the planned conversion to transitional parking continues to keep the impacts of these vehicles in and around JPS's primary project site. Um, JPS will speak to the long-term development plans for this site. These lots A and B are included in the master plan. Um, which lets staff know what the long-term plan is for them. So they are truly transitional. The proposed paving site design and layout of site plans for lots A and B clearly meet the standards in our zoning ordinance for parking lot design, which includes stripe spaces, um, ADA spots, and pavement. And the zoning in this area is NST5I, which is the industrial zoning of the near south side, which allows a lot more um, flexibility of uses than other sub-districts. Um, also, there is very little, um, there are few gaps in the sidewalk network in this area. The only gap we identified was on the um, south side of Magnolia Ave, on the north side of Lot B, there is a small sidewalk gap of about 115 feet. So that's a fairly complete sidewalk network. Um, the proposed design for these transitional parking lots is therefore generally consistent with general development principles Principles 2B1, promote a pedestrian-oriented urban form, and 2B2, maximizing connectivity and access. Um, staff is recommending for denial without prejudice all waivers for lots C, D, and F on, on the following basis. Um, lots C, D, and F, and I'll show them here. This is lot C, this is lot D, and this is lot F. Um, these sites are approximately a quarter of a mile away from the primary JPS campus. Um, so um, the employee parking located there will require some, some walking. Um, and the impacts of vehicles parked there will not be directly adjacent to um, the master plan site, as far as we know. Um, staff has not seen plans for long-term redevelopment of these sites after they are no longer transitional parking lots. Um, the proposed surface treatment of gravel does not clearly meet the zoning ordinances, um, parking design requirements. Um, and then the zoning in this area is NST5N, so it is more neighborhood focused and not industrial. It is also um, adjacent to, these sites are adjacent to multifamily on the east and the um, commercial walkable Bryan Avenue district on the west. And so um, the treatment here just needs to be more thoughtful. Um, there are also a, a significant amount of sidewalk gaps in this area. There's about 2,000 plus linear feet of perimeter streets that are missing sidewalks in those areas. And the ones that do exist are not in great condition. Um, staff is therefore recommending um, denial without prejudice uh, of these waivers for C, D, and F. However, um, additional documentation and minor changes would change this request or would change the recommendation of staff. So I'm going to briefly note those items that would help support this. Um, additional clarification for the number of parking spots proposed for each site that is currently gravel um, and supporting uh, documentation, doc 
documentation showing what parking spots are going away at JPS so that we know what's being replaced. Um, and so that we can consider whether a reduction in the overall parking provided um, is possible. Um, additional details about the treatment for the unpaved gravel only lots. Um, is the grid system provided? What is the, the sort of strategy for keeping the gravel on the site? Um, a phasing plan showing a similar treatment for lots A, as was provided for lots A and B. Um, and also clarifying which of these lots um, and perhaps all of them, but you know, if public parking is going to be provided in off peak hours, how will that be managed? Um, and then uh, identifying gaps in the sidewalk network, which is actually something JPS will speak to because they've provided an updated exhibit. Um, overall staff is recommending that the request for a certificate of appropriateness for all waivers from the near south side development code standards and guidelines for lots A and B be approved subject to the following conditions, that the sidewalk network along the perimeter streets of lots A and B be completed, and that any adjustments made to the drawings be submitted to the Development Services Department prior to the issuance of a certificate of appropriateness, and that the request for a certificate of appropriateness for all waivers from the near south side development code standards and guidelines for lots C, D, and F be denied without prejudice. This concludes the staff report. Thank you. Um, one question for clarification. Um, do you know if it's in the zoning code or in the building code about dust-free lots, parking lots? There is, um, in our standards for parking lot design, in our right. zoning code, okay. it does, uh, dust-free is one of the items mentioned, um, just for standard parking lot design. Okay. Yeah. Do, does gravel comply with that requirement? Potentially. Okay. Um, we may need additional details to verify that. Okay. I don't I don't think it absolutely doesn't, but because we've allowed it other places in the near south side. Um, so I think that we would like to examine that further okay. and just know more about the treatment. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Is there anyone here to speak in favor of this case? Hello. I'm Adam Lane. I'm the Chief Facility Management Officer, VP at JPS. So I'm not going to speak directly to these. We thought it would be a good idea at JPS to inform the board of our master plan as we're going to be coming in front of you many more times in the future here as we unwind our $1.5 billion redevelopment of JPS. So do you have a pointer? Yeah, I do. Awesome. So this is the campus as it currently exists with the west side of Maine and the tower. This was the site of the old St. Joe's Hospital. Um, this is the eligibility center. Currently that is considered lot A in the presentation. This is lot B. These are JPOC office buildings and this lot is the JPOC lot. Currently this is the medical examiner's building. Um, the psychiatric hospital is down here. The Allen Street Garage is over here. The main pavilion building is here with the pavilion garage. Allen Street is right here. Main Street runs this way, Magnolia here. Let's go to the next slide. Um, I think you can just... Do I have it? Nope. Uh, oh, I got it. There you go. <laughs> so first off, all of these are not happening concurrently. But we want to show you the basic phase one of the master plan. Um, and of course, this being Texas, everything is predicated on parking because we love our cars and we are limited on parking. Um, currently, as I mentioned, we have the Allen Street Garage, the Pavilion Garage and the Morphe Street Garage. The Morphe Street Garage has structural issues with it. We've done some repairs. It will be coming down in the future. It is an I viable garage in the future. And we have a number of, of structural studies on that garage. So currently our parking lots or right here where the physicians park and staff are TSP. This parking lot for JPOC and the eligibility center has minimal parking that serves both the eligibility center and the foundation building that is right here. Again, the green space here um, is exactly that. The notion is that we need to alleviate the parking issue on the campus so that we can develop the rest of the campus, including a new parking garage. Um, First pieces going up that you will see um, countywide are the Medical Home Southwest, which is not on this campus, it's over on Granbury Road. 
um, and that's coming through the process as well and working through the city currently. And the PEC, which you see here, which is to alleviate our emergency center for the psychiatric care um, component, which is on the 10th floor of the tower. That's a very unusual setup in a hospital. We are leaving the, alleviating that area and then increasing the key planning units, meaning the number of, of patients that we can see and joining that up to the GSB. That will take out a number of parking spaces as we redevelop that. What you will find as the plans come to you and they will be coming to you shortly. In fact, the parking in the front of the PEC along Allen will no longer exist. It will be a green space. And the reason it's a green space is it does not make efficient parking. We cannot get access from either side from the corners. It doesn't make sense to have parking there. And again, we were working with Mike on that because we wanna reinvent some of the green spaces we have around the campus as this green space disappears or gets used up in the future. So that is one of the first green spaces we will have. Once those start though, in the interim, we would like to build transitional parking in this area and this area to alleviate the parking. The reason that we're doing that is because coming online shortly after we start this within the next year is a new parking garage. There are 530 spaces in this lot, just in this rectangle. I'm not including this space right here. These two lots together are 530 spaces, give or take a few spaces. This garage is intended to be 2,800 spaces. So an eight story garage, we're working through that with Mike. The whole front face of the garage, separate project, but they will be developed um, in parallel, will be a large medical office building. So the front face of Magnolia still is in within keeping of the Magnolia Street District retail development on the lower floor, et cetera, so that we don't see a garage on that face. We don't want to see it. Near Southside doesn't want to see it. Nobody wants to see your garage there. Um, the facade of the, of the MOB will in fact wrap around the sides of the garage so that there will be no perception of that garage. It may be full facade, it may disintegrate, some kind of art treatment in that base. The back side of the garage we will still leave open because we have the opportunity of future development here. The JPOC buildings are quite old at some point. That's an ideal property to redevelop uh, for more medical office and possibly an extension of a garage again with more facade so that again, we develop that over the time as we grow. Um, what you see over in this area is an extension of the North Pavilion. Um, we need to do this in order to build our new hospital towers. The back of the North Pavilion, if you've been in that area, is very crenellated. It's not conducive to attaching another full building to. This allows us to extend our trauma one, our level one trauma center on the first floor and our emergency areas, as well as on the second floor extending our surgery suites, which are all on the second floor of that building. Um, additionally, what that does is that will then connect to a second floor plinth that runs the full length of this. And there's another master plan I think Mike has in here. I'd like to show you that after we get through this. Um, in addition to all the other development, we have a development of a central utility plant. In fact, we are looking at a cogeneration plant to develop our own power. Um, currently, we have three plants on our campus and 14 megawatts of power scattered all over the place, dating from 1934 all the way to the present. Um, they're underground here. We have one over here that supports TSP. There's one in the garage. We're going to co-locate all of those with a new plant to be much more energy efficient as we build all these buildings. And, and I'll go to the other master plan in a second. The two new towers intend to go here and in the future there will be another office building here, a support service building that will hold our administration, finance, human resources, all those components. In the back of this area where Morphe Garage is, we intend to build a central loading dock area by medical waste stock. In essence, the design of the campus is all service functions back up to the railroad tracks so that they're no longer on Felix Drive, coming in the front off of Allen Street to the back, that's one component. The other component is then all the hospital functions align along Main. Very convenient. Then the outpatient zone ends up in this area across the street. So you'll see sky bridges coming across Main, et cetera. What we're looking at, it's a very unique opportunity on this campus, um, having built many hospital campuses before. 
It's almost like we're building a greenfield hospital, but it's a mature hospital at the same time. So we're really able to separate our circulation as you would in a brand new hospital. Well, all visitor traffic will run along the front face along Main through sky bridges, but all service traffic, meaning pedestrian, patients, et cetera, will run interior on the backside of the hospital. And then all vehicular service traffic runs along the back of the hospital. So that means that ambulances and normal visitor traffic run this way. And we in fact are inserting a drive this way in the back so that the ambulance bay has two means of ingress and egress, which it currently does not have right now, which is quite dangerous. Um, if you've been in that area, you'll notice there's a loading dock in this area. Sometimes trucks block the ambulance drive. So that's an issue. Um, also with the new towers, you will see that we are inserting a park back on the front face of those buildings. And we'll, if we can go to the other presentation so that we can show the floor plan of this. Um, it's within Mike's presentation. This one right there. This? This one right below it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So here you'll see the PEC. It's actually, sorry, the PEC is much larger than that now. It's about three times the size of that, given the KPUs we have, key planning units. So much of this parking will go away. In fact, only the parking in this space right here in this central lot will remain. That is physician parking and will remain as physician parking for the PEC. So we are dependent on this garage and the temporary lots, transitional lots. Once the garage is built, estimated timeline is less than three years from now, then we will start construction on the towers as well. So that transitional parking truly is transitional. And as you can see, we are looking at inserting visitor, um, excuse me, visitor access across the front face of all of this, service along this, and you can see the sky bridge is indicated, and then vehicular service along the back. Um, again, insertion of park spaces here in front of the PUC, the Allen Street Park remains, and then insertion of park space here in the front. That is our current master plan. Timeline, including the towers, is approximately six to seven years. So we're going to be busy. Um, so I look forward to seeing you a lot. <laughs> so I think I'll leave the rest to Anna and Mike. They are running this part of the transitional. So Anna, if you would. Just Thank a question. So, so that address lots A and B, what about the other lots? I'm going to let this lady address that. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Good. Fantastic. Good morning, all. Uh, my name is Anna Carrillo, and I'm uh, honored to be the civil engineer for JPS on this particular part of the program, which is very important, very critical, because it lays the groundwork for a program that is uh, several years long. And uh, it's important that we lay the groundwork now and well so that this program can evolve during that time frame. We have uh, been working with Mike extensively, also with different departments of city staff in every one of these because there's different things to keep in mind. And I'll talk about those a little bit uh, more, uh, whether it's stormwater runoff, whether it's access, or improving the network of sidewalk and pedestrian viability around the area. So this slide right here has the north area. So there is not a development plan. I know that that question has come up quite a bit. There is not, you know, uh, Adam obviously showed all the 3D and all the rendering, the master plan for the campus itself. So there is not per se a development plan at this time. However, this is a transitional period. So there, what we expect to see an evolution in that, and we are open to that. And we'll speak to that a little bit more. So lot C is uh, on the north side of Dashwood. Lot D is immediately north of that, north of Terrell. Uh, and then lot E, which we're not hearing today, but it's also going to be coming forward. Uh, is on the west side of Bryant, and then lot F on the north side of uh, Luda. On lot F is where we are proposing to relocate the, the warehouse, and this is that is the only lot that will at this time be fenced. So I think that's important to show. Some of the exhibits showed uh, before um, the nice chain link fence, but we, there's been numerous conversations. And uh, at this time, it has been decided that that will be the only one that will be fenced for storage materials, primarily construction materials. That is a primary use of the warehouse. And that is one of the reasons that we don't have all the 
open. And I'm not an architect, but all the fenestration and all of the uh, the open windows and what have you on the warehouse itself. But however, we are proposing to do some artwork and continue to work with Near South Side and others to provide a very aesthetically pleasing uh, elevation on that warehouse. So if we can, uh, a few points that I wanted to make on uh, the toy knot. Can you go on to the one that has the bullet points, uh, Jane? Yeah, that is. So I'd like to, uh, you know, speak to these uh, bullet points in response to comments that we have received both from the Near Southside Committee, as we have been working with Mike and that group, as well as on some on the staff report today. Um, so again, I pointed out that only lot F is the one that will be store, uh, fenced at this time. Also, oh, before, I, before I go into these, I'd like to point out that in just in conversations with JPS, they have been very diligent and busy lately and determined that exact number of spaces that are being lost in that first phase of the development and implementation part of the program. And uh, we, uh, lots A and B in terms of constructing those and providing the staff parking are at the top of the priority list. However, lots D, C and D are very near that and they are moving up in priority level. So. Today we ask, I know that those, there's a recommendation for denial of those that we would like to do everything possible to get approval of those, even if it is with conditions, because we are very open to satisfying those conditions as need be. So um, there's been discussions and requests as to whether these uh, lots can be used by the public during off hours of JPS, obviously that is something that is in discussion. JPS is very open to that understanding the need and that these lots are further up, uh, further north and they are in an area where there's quite a bit of pedestrian activity and need for parking. The details of that will continue to be worked out, whether it's signage and what those exact hours and off hours for JPS are that can be um, opened up to the public. So we, we continue those conversations, but that is something that is very much in the works. Uh, why gravel lots? There's a couple of reasons. These truly are transitional lots. And it's important to understand that there will, this, uh, the program duration will be somewhat of a dynamic process because of what Adam described earlier, there will be construction in different areas and that program will evolve and the needs of the program will evolve. So for example, at the beginning before the garage is constructed, obviously there's a higher need for parking. Once the parking garage is constructed and we have the supply then, then we won't need as much parking spaces on these lots. So it's, I think it's important to understand that that dynamic process will evolve as time goes by and uh, gravel will lend itself a lot better for um, removal and or transi transitional use. Uh, I think Mike has some examples later of some gravel parking lots that have been in the area and how they have evolved and it has been very successful. Uh, somebody alluded earlier as to whether gravel can be clean and dust free. It can. It obviously requires, it's a lot cleaner than, than for example, a uh, road base that tends to be dusty and maybe get muddy, whereas gravel can be a lot cleaner. It can also uh, compact very well. And um, the JPS has a very strong maintenance plan uh, for that. Another reason is the preservation of trees. Gravel lends itself a lot more to where we don't have to do as much grading and impact the, the root systems of these significant and large trees that are in all of these lots. and. Uh, and, and they can even be used for shading, right? In terms of somebody parking there during the day. And, and so that's, and we get to preserve the trees. I think it was on lot B as well that we were showing that we are trying our best to keep all of those perimeter trees are on the side. So that's an initiative that is very important to us. And we are working closely on that. So on these other lots that used to be old residential lots, there's interior trees and we will do our best to preserve some of those. Another reason is, as you may have uh, obviously seen very recently, where we have a very, had a very 
large storm event, that area is very challenged, especially the north. Those north blocks are very challenged by drainage issues that were um, that we just uh, had an opportunity to to see. And there is uh, the uh, the Oak Timbers apartment are right next to them, and they're on downstream. So we are working very closely with their stormwater group on doing some sort of um, on street, I mean, on parking mitigation for those stormwater runoff and gravel really lends itself to that much better than a hard surface parking. Uh, one of the concerns was at one point we were showing the warehouse further closer to Main Street and one of the things that we have done is moved it over to the back on Crawford Street. A couple of things, it, it pulls it away from Main Street, but it also allows its access from for pickup and delivery off of Crawford, which is a street that has actually been improved, whereas some of the other streets remain unimproved. In terms of development potential in the area, uh, JPS has always been a partner that has been very open for development in the, in the past, and I think Mike and others can attest to that, and that will not be any different moving forward. If there is development opportunity for those lots, there, uh, JPS is open to allowing that to happen just like they have done uh, at other times. Um, like I said, this is a dynamic program. It's, it's going to be evolving over the next several years. And then uh, the pedestrian connectivity. I think that's very important and we have, uh, um, we, have pre we pre prepared this slide. The uh, green sidewalks are those that are there. We have walked them. And those appear very, um, they're in really decent shape. And a lot of the reason is because of the improvements that have already taken place on Main Street, Bryan, and Crawford. So the handicap ramps are there, but they're, and they do have sidewalks. Same thing is for the handicap ramps, say, at the intersection of Terrell and Crawford and Luda and Crawford. The ramps are there because they were put as part of the improvement of Crawford Street but then the connectivity isn't there to Main Street. So JPS has made a commitment to um, complete that, that uh, sidewalk network and provide those areas in red at their own expense, even though that some of the projects do not touch those because we understand the, the uh, importance of providing that connectivity from the Oak Timbers apartments, but also from a, from a public standpoint. And then I, I'm not sure if I mentioned earlier that I think there was a question that came up about the uh, distance from the parking lots to the JPS facilities, and there will be shuttle service provided to each one of these lots. So I think that's all I have. If there's any questions for me, I'll be happy to answer. I guess on that slide, you're saying the red ones, it was a little difficult to hear. The red ones are the ones that are planning to be installed? Correct. The okay. green ones we have analyzed and they are in decent condition. Okay, and and so for those red ones, why wouldn't they extend all the way around the block? Uh, what was important and what was brought up was that the, the connectivity from Crawford to Maine was more critical, but we are extending that along the north side of Bryan, which has a lot more activity. There is not as much pedestrian activity. Well, Crawford Street is, has, is, uh, and is an improved street already. We identified these areas to be the most critical to provide that connection from the, especially from the Oak Timbers apartment where, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, but it's, a, I think it's a senior living senior and, affordable. and affordable. So there is a great need to make that connection from east to west. And that was the primary priority put on this uh, plan. But and why only on one side of the street? Why only on the north side, not the south side? The dent, the amount of of pedestrian traffic is not that great. There is need for that connection, but it's not like you really need the two the two sides because the crosswalks are there. There are handicap ramps on every corner, and so the crosswalks are there, and you can make your way with one side of the street. Okay. It's not it's not like in a traffic operation for vehicular activity where you actually have that many that many cars that you need to or multiple lanes, right? In this case it may be just one one or two people at, at a time. I mean if there's a peak hour somebody's leaving, you know, restaurants are closing or whatever and, and, and they're getting 
they're leaving then in that case you may have more people but you're not going to have a significant but that doesn't number. make any sense because you're you're encouraging people to park there you're going to put more cars there there's going to be more people you're going to need more sidewalks and and even if this is elderly and you have one person that's having to cross the street again it just it doesn't make sense to me that you'd only do one side and not the other well that's something that we can uh, visit with uh, with staff and with mike and see you know look at those yeah. patterns of uh, pedestrian activity yeah. and uh, distribute accordingly. Obviously, we're trying to do everything that is, you know, that we can do. And JPS is, is uh, has that position right. as well, within reason, and obviously giving back to the community and to the public as much as possible. Well, absolutely. Usually when you come to ask for waivers, you try to mitigate with something else. And so I think just sure. doing the bare minimum of sidewalks is not really the right gesture. Okay. Well, we can certainly take a look at that. Like okay. I mentioned earlier, it's uh, it's very critical that we obtain approval. Um, so we are open to having that approval with conditions. Okay. It is, I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to ask a question about the parking. So I know you mentioned that the 530 sort of washes out on the other side of campus. Why are C and D critical? I think it's just based on the needs of the program. I think that's something that just came up. Lou, okay. you can answer that. Uh, we've worked out a good morning or afternoon. Um, my name is Lou Mattingly. I'm the uh, director of the planning, design, and construction there at JPS. Um, as we begin all these construction activities on our main campus, we've looked at a, a traffic impact uh, study, and not only uh, of staff, but contractors. So to, to the extent that we um, take up our, uh, our JPOC, the large parking lot for the new parking garage, and, and how we um, showed that we're looking at uh, lots A and B for public, for staff, for physicians, for patients, you know, we want to keep them close. But to, in order for us to do that and, and also accommodate our operations with contractors, um, we, we're projecting a, a peak contractor of, um, you know, preliminary evaluation of up to 400 uh, contractors or more. Um, so when that parking lot is is underway, although the uh, the new parking garage will relieve that parking, that's when we start our uh, our new hospital, and that's that's when we're going to have the most contractors. So that overflow of uh, parking also is gonna require uh, lot C, D, E, and, and um, F to the, to the level that we're not um, using for material storage in the, in the warehouse. And that's very limited for you know, overflow of material storage for items that require like uh, condition space. Okay, so the intent for the warehouse is materials used for construction or for JPS? For construction and for JPS, we'd like a little bit of flexibility. Um, like Anna was saying, it's going to be pretty dynamic. So as we go in uh, to some of our existing areas, there's going to be we're going to need a space to to put that. We would also we would like to have that opportunity to leverage some of our uh, existing facilities. Yes, sir. Okay. What. What do you anticipate these lots transitioning into after the seven-year plan is complete? So after we're done with these lots, we want to return them to their current state, uh, obviously in better condition than we left them uh, with the uh, addition of sidewalks and, um, and uh, you know, the conditions of this committee. So, um, and this may be for Anna, there was a, a mention about the tree preservation. Has a layout been done for each of those parking lots to show which trees are going to be preserved and how the parking is going to work? Yes, uh, there has been. So, uh, we actually submitted recently a, a progress set of documents to uh, the contractor for pricing purposes. And then those, uh, those, and also we submitted a drainage study for lots A and B, and then we're submitting one to for the rest of the lots to the stormwater management group this um, this week, or uh, yeah, I think by the end of this week. And in those, we have done more grading because, like I said, we are really working to do some on-site uh, drainage mitigation. Okay. And what we're trying to only grade at the lower areas of the lower, meaning drain downstream areas of those lots, and then 
put somewhat of a curb barrier to slow down the runoff and uh, wherever we are not grading. So we have identified those areas that we can preserve those trees. So yes, we have. Okay. In terms of parking, we actually did prepare some layouts um, as if they for striping to see how much how many parking spaces we could um, get from each one of those and still meet the city parking requirements. You know, drive aisle width. If we have, right. um, yeah. So we actually do want to do that, and and we have prepared those lots. And it was also important to pre pre uh, present that to JPS so that they could take that into account into their overall drain uh, parking counts. And uh, there's a couple of different ways that we can delineate those spaces. I know that you can start with striping. It may not last very long because of the gravel movement, but uh, wheel stops, providing wheel stops is also a good way that sometimes you can pave a small area and just set a president of those first parking uh, stripes. And so people, as people come into the parking lot, those say that's first three spaces park and then you have wheel stops and then it just sets the president for the rest of the aisles to be parked. So we have, and we have the numbers that those lots would yield. If you're interested, I have them right here. Yeah, it just seems like it's gonna be very complicated to preserve trees and have efficient parking on those small lots. Is the intent that the curb cuts are on the short sides of the, the blocks? The intent of the, the, the uh, this one we are actually. Or, yeah, not the A and B, the, okay. the gravel lots, like uh, D. There's a couple of different things. One is, is uh, efficiency circulation, right, right. for parking and, and so with tree preservation layouts and all that. So that's one of the items to balance. The other one is um, the impact to adjacent streets. So we have also met with the streets department of uh, TPW and see what, what makes sense because we don't want to add more congestion to Bryan per se, we, but it would make sense to put them in more on Crawford also because those streets are improved, whereas maybe Luda is in, it's in worse condition and we don't want to impact it as any more than it already is. So there's some moving elements there that we have been coordinating as to where to provide the access, yes. Okay, yeah, I, I know that there's a program that's uh, improved some of those streets. Do we know, is Luda on the schedule somewhere or? Okay, all right. But we have met with that group as well. Okay. Is there any lighting? Yes, yes, there is. I believe, uh, I don't have the exact numbers with me, but I think that was just recently discussed and there is, uh, I think at least two, uh, two, uh, Three light, two, light, two lights on each uh, lot, is that correct? Yeah, still lots C and D. Yes, and then also, in addition to that, there's also code blue phones, one on the north uh, extreme and one on the south extreme, and I think that's very important, not just for uh, JPS users, but also for the public. Um, uh, cameras as well, that's another thing that will be added. Okay. Um, Commissioner Stamper, I, I had a question for the applicant. Um, so I, I can certainly appreciate the the long term planning and the you know you mentioned the dynamic nature, the use of these lots, and wanting to have flexibility, and some of the other reasons for for pursuing the gravel um, on the interior. Obviously, if it's transitional use, you know, if we can mitigate the the water runoff and all that, I'm in complete agreement on the flexibility of the interior of the, of the lots and what you desire. Um, I guess I'm I'm curious why not comply with near south side right of way guidelines because presumably with um, with a long term plan. All of those guidelines, you know, the standards and guidelines to developing the right of way portions of these blocks would be complied with at some point. And for me to have those done up front when it doesn't impact the flexible use of the interior uh, boundaries of the private private ownership land, it, it would drastically improve the just the overall uh, user experience over there, including to have those pedestrian lights and street trees. It would just go a long way to improving the overall neighborhood experience and I think providing a safer 
you know, usage experience for all of the contractors and potential employees that will be using these lots and still provide all the flexibility you want for future construction on the actual owned private property. So uh, I'm curious about the reasons behind not doing those right of way improvements up front, along with the request for the gravel parking lots. I think the the, the uh, short answer is these are really transitional lots. That that's that's the the main goal of these lots is to be transitional and to ser serve that transitional purpose. Um, the other portion of that is that there is development potential in this area. This, these areas are significantly further north, and there's been a whole lot, and, and I'm sure Mike can speak to that, you know, and obviously we all see it. There's a whole lot that's happening on the north side off of uh, South Main Street in Bryan, and whenever those plans come in, it would make sense for those to coordinate that to the for the design of those uh, street uh, elements, you know, the street, the trees, lights, you know, for those to be part of the design and to actually meet the design of each, as each of one of these lots and blocks develop. Yeah, but there, are, but the standards and guidelines exist for, for both the, you know, what you're expected to do with this property as you develop it and you're asking for a waiver from that. And those standards, those same standards and guidelines will exist for whoever comes along later what i'm saying is the standard application of those right away improvements uh is just that it's a standard so if you were to improve the right of way you would be improving it for everything that comes along later with the exception of probably a curb cut or two you know to meet the individual needs of later development on the interior of the block but what i'm saying is those sidewalks will be useful from day one if you put them in from day one the street trees will be that much bigger and useful for the seven years until maybe something happens on these on these blocks. Um, the, there just doesn't seem much of a downside to doing those right of way improvements. I understand and I am sympathetic with, uh, you know, saying the addition of the um, coverage of the lots, screening of the lots, paving of the lots. I'm sympathetic with uh, with waivers associated with that aspect. Jesse, I might just add, um, you know, during work session, I kind of had that initial thought. And as they you start to kind of peel back the layers of the, you know, the, the master plan and time frame, you know, I'd agree it'd be nice to set the the streetscape standards now, give time for the trees to mature, you know, create a, a more walkable uh, setting. But I think as these develop, we, we, you know, whether it's the, the current developer or another future developer, uh, the need for, you know, additional infrastructure improvements that may be, you know, subsurface, you know, we've already noted a, a drainage issues in the area. There may be... Uh, additional storm or uh, water, sanitary sewer. So we might be just ripping those improvements out to put in uh, a new streetscape. So Mike's obviously intimately familiar with the, the infrastructure here, so he could probably elaborate, but that was just maybe a, a point to add of why now may not be the, the right time to do that. Well, but I think when you look at the perimeter of the block to make a, a sewer tap, a water tap, fire tap, you know, I mean, those kind of things, you're not going to disturb more than 10% of that streetscape. And I'm just talking if there's major, you know, main improvements that yeah. we're not entirely sure where they are. Yeah. It, you know, it's, I'm not making the argument on behalf of them. It's just a point yeah. that I wanted to, to make. Yeah, thank you for that, Douglas. I think that's a very valid point. Um, the need for these lots, like we mentioned, is is now. Um, and the process to go there, for example, one of a couple of these, because they were old residential lots, you know, have multiple driveways. So there would be an abandonment of multiple driveways that would need to take place. That can get into the um, improvement of a street, you know, to add curb and gutter, which in turn could add to working with the water department. And if they say, well, there is a size that is 
uh, there's a water line that is undersized and, and we've been planning to upsize it. So, and that all takes time. So it doesn't mean that this cannot take place, but it does it open it up to a whole lot bigger and broader scope than the immediate use of those these parking lots, which is really the, the hardship of the whole program, right, is to provide parking in a, a starting immediately. And I'll let Lou add to that. But from a practical standpoint and infrastructure standpoint, I, that is, uh, that's a significant undertaking. Uh, the only comment I was going to make for the committee to just take into consideration on, on this topic is um, we do have a, a fixed budget, and, and please don't hear this comment wrong. Um, we we want to balance uh, those dollars, you know, the best that we can for the program. So, um, uh, um, so whatever additional dollars we, we spend in this area, it'll be less um, than we spend towards patient care. Um, or something contributing to patient care. So I just wanted to make that comment. We do have a fixed budget, and it just kind of balances. So if more gets spent over here, then less gets spent over here. Totally understand, but I think uh, the first person said the budget was somewhere with a with a B, right? It, it was, and every single one of those dollars are accounted for. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, then it may not have been planned very well. All right, uh, Mike, I think you have a presentation. Yes, thank you. And Jamie, I apologize. We're probably going to be jumping around a little bit, so I'll, I'll do my best to, to keep us on track. Let's start with this slide here. So I'm going to make two major points, and, and there'll be a lot of details that we'll get into. This is a case where, obviously, the commission is charged with, with considering the, the details of particular waivers, but also taking into account sort of big picture context of this, of what will be the, the largest um, expansion project in the history of our medical innovation district in the near south side. This is a great view of the the lots that we're talking about here. So I get the, the letters mixed up, but um, I think that the, the warehouse block is this. That might have been block F. Mm -hmm. um, C and D are here. So these were the, the two main parking lots. You can see in this photograph, um, if you look closely, Bryan Avenue from Terrell, going south to Rosedale has been reconstructed, part of the near south side um, street uh, reconstruction program. You see the new sidewalks there, the accessibility ramps. North of Terrell going this way um, is perhaps the worst street conditions that we still have in the near south side. These streets were included in the program. The program is intended to, to be closely coordinated with development projects so that we're um, right-sizing water lines because as soon as we start messing with these streets, and I think Anna referred to this, the water department has to replace the water lines underneath because they're too old and they will, they will break when the street is repaired. So um, all of these streets have been subject just to asphalt repair. The, the city's done a really good job. There, was, there is a lot of truck traffic uh, in the area, but um, any talk about the construction of sidewalks and uh, more importantly, the construction of the full roadside um, elements that the near south side code requires for new building construction. That all the dominoes that Anna referred to have to be taken into account. Um, so um, we'll, 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 we'll get to, to those details in a little bit. I wanted to, to start with um, a related discussion about the long-term development of the site. We are very confident that this, this site and these, um, the, the transitional use of these lots sets up this area for um, the best long-term development outcomes. Um, we have been working with JPS over the last few years, and Adam will probably um, be... Uh, scared if we take this too literally, um, but this is a, a, a visioning exercise that looks at these properties, great location within the Medical Innovation District, um, as a great opportunity to take that Innovation District to a higher level. So what you see here in concept is a biotech research park. Um, you can see, though, that 
this is a, an in, incredible design, highly walkable, highly engaging, but also has some unique treatments of the street network, the roadsides, and so forth. We hope that there is the opportunity, and we as an organization near Southside Inc., we're working as the economic development, community development organization leading the areas of revitalization in partnership with partners like JPS. We want to continue to be um, leading that conversation over these six to seven years so that when that transition is ready for the next stage, um, there is something exciting coming to these parcels. And we're confident with the market that we have in the near south side today that that's a given, that these, these parcels will be developed. And when they are developed, all of those elements that we're talking about, the street trees, the lights, the sidewalks, and maybe even a special treatment of all of those public realm elements is possible. I can tell you if these parcels just were put on the market today for development, um, what we would get would be multifamily projects block by block filled up the, would fill up the entire site. We have one that will be built um, just down here that'll, that'll go to construction, and we have a project that'll soon be announced north of Pennsylvania. This is a more desirable outcome than just more multifamily. Um, all right, let's uh, let's dive into the the details a little bit. Um, Jamie, if you'll jump to those transitional parking lots. Yeah, that slots. should be next in the deck if you um, switch forward. Okay. okay. It's very important that our district remain um, as a, a, a in the adaptive mode so that we can respond to specific circumstances as they come on as, as they come up. This was a great example back in, this is a shot from I think 2016 or so. People will remember this as just a grass lot behind the Sawyer Lofts building. This is where Stir Crazy, when Stir Crazy Baked Goods opened up, they were first here. There was no parking on this site. And then we decided to reconstruct South Main Street. So during the reconstruction of South Main Street, this became a transitional parking lot. None of those requirements of um, street trees, um, lights, all of that were applied to this transitional parking lot. It filled a critical role of facilitating another project, in that case, the reconstruction of South Main Street. Over time, it evolved into a more formal condition, and in partnership with the, the street repair program, which reconstructed Bryan and put in these sidewalks here, and uh, some resurfacing and wheel stops and so forth, that has become a critical parking lot for the South Main Village area. That sort of evolution and adaptation is what we want uh, these big projects to facilitate. It's not always apples to apples uh, comparisons, but generally two purposes are served by these transitional parking lots. They're either providing key parking for our urban village areas, which that previous example is doing, which I just showed, or they're facilitating another site's redevelopment, um, in some cases a, a major redevelopment, as we see with JPS. In this case, because JPS is willing to allow the public use of those lots in off, uh, or I guess uh, non-business hours, uh, evenings and weekends, this is sort of a dual purpose case. Um, we can see at Connex that gravel is a, a great surface for parking lots. They have a grid system. That's probably the, the gold-plated version of a gravel lot, um, but just the type of rock that they use is clearly dust-free. Um, and we also have seen that without our really noticing it, what is proposed by JPS is a pretty common condition in the near south side. If you drive uh, along 8th Avenue at Pennsylvania today, Cook Children's has major projects under construction on the south side of Pennsylvania. If you look at the old Westchester site, it is a transitional lot now. Now, in, instead of the, the warehouses that, or the warehouse that JPS proposes, you'll see um, storage containers lined up on that site, storing construction materials. You'll see contractor parking there. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a more conventional construction site type of environment. I think what JPS has proposed through working with us and the staff is an outcome that 
is the best that we could ever expect for this transitional use. Um, the construction of sidewalks to, to fill gaps, the use of the lots for public parking, um, a, a partnership on the, on the warehouse so that it's a friendly neighbor to the folks living across the street, gravel surface um, to mitigate against any runoff, preservation of trees, all of those boxes are being checked. It turns out that we have an opportunity, a policy opportunity to maybe keep some of these cases off of your agenda by having a more predictable set of standards for these transitional lots. As I said, this is not, it's not the first one of its kind. These things have happened. Sometimes uh, the city of Fort Worth has said no permit is required. Other times they've said, you know, the full near south side roadside standards are required. We, we need to work together to get some clarity and some more predictability. And certainly in this case, we don't want the, that sort of gray area that we're in now to slow down what is such an important project. So we're here strongly in favor and feel good about the, the terms that have been set, obviously open to additional um, conversation from the commission to see if there are other things that might be added to make it even better. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, I guess one question for me would be the, the details because I know tree preservation was mentioned, but all of the trees that exist on that site are not gonna be preserved if you're trying to park in and around them. So I think it'd be good to understand what that balances between tree preservation and, and what's gonna to need to be removed to get a, an efficient parking lot. Because none of the other examples you showed had trees on them. That's true. There is a provision in the near south side code that, that uh, I think is a 27 inch um, diameter tree classified as a significant tree. You're required to preserve those. Um, and if you want to remove one, there's, a, there's when the fees uh, kick in or mitigation. So I'm confident that it seems like we should be confident that any tree of that size is gonna, they're gonna be able to work around. Um, but I agree the details of that should be worked out. Yeah, and I think that the, the sidewalks are still a concern for me. I understand that, um, you know, it may be difficult to try and develop those block faces without you know, impacting curb and gutter and all that. But I mean, is the plan to remove all of the driveways that exist on those old residential lots? Eventually, when the when the street program can include these streets, yeah. Um, and you know, JPS owns all of these properties. With their agreement, we would remove all of those driveways. Yeah. Okay, but. In the interim, they're just going to remain and people are going to be able to use them to access the lots. I would defer to the uh, to Anna on the specific um, access design on each of the lots. Yeah, we can certainly provide that additional information. Uh, the uh, the plan was not to remove all of those, but the understanding that the addition of those sidewalk or sidewalks will be handicap accessible. So they need so if there is any driveways that are in the way of the sidewalks or are too steep, there is a cross that does not allow, for example, the required maximum cross slope, then those areas would be removed to make way for the sidewalks. In terms of uh, access, they can be blocked off um, so that the, they are not used to gain like i said we could use the, the through the you saw a picture with the wheel stops and so their access can be controlled in a certain manner yeah i i i understand i i think that's why i say i think we need a little bit more detail to get comfortable with this idea i think in those examples that mike had they were very concise and very small and they worked out well. We're talking about multiple blocks here and multiple different conditions with where are trees going to be preserved, where are they not, where sidewalks exist, how their new ones are going to be improved. I think, I mean, we just don't have that level of detail right now. Okay, that's something that can, that can be provided. Yeah. So it's ready and it can be provided. Yeah, I think those would be my big concerns is just about circulation and safety. 
uh, you know, people are intended to park there and then either go to JPS or to South Main or, you know, wherever else they need to have a safe way to get there. Sure. I mean, I don't think you guys want any more business over JPS, do you? <laughs> All right. Just for my understanding, by safety, you mean a safe pedestrian path? Is yes. that right? Okay. Right. Okay. And so, I mean, I think that I, my interpretation of that, I think it's a little bit open. Uh, well, you, you also have to deal with accessibility requirements, too. I mean, you know, once you provide a parking lot, you've got to have a number of accessible spaces. So those will have to be paved. And then you have to have a, I mean, it, that's what I'm saying. This is all in the details that has to be worked out. Those sorts of details because of the, you know, that's a basic code requirement. Um, I would think we would be confident that that compliance is assumed. Is yes. that right? Yes. And like I said, we have a yeah. Okay. So we would add that a little bit to be closer to the but that is the, that's basically the code. We, uh, all of the sidewalks, like I say, some of the curb ramps are there and yeah. they are compliant because they're, they're are recent. Some of them are not. Some of them are old, they're broken up. We would remove and replace those because the sidewalks do need to be, provide accessible routes per TAS and ADA requirements. So those will be very much so. Also as a function of number of park, total number of parking spaces, there is a need and a requirement, <clears throat> a basic requirement to Mike's point of how many handicap accessible parking spaces with appropriate signage and striping need to be there and those will be right okay be well i mean right. it sounds like if there's already some of that information in there development is. that it could be shared with us and yeah and like like i mentioned earlier we have been constantly working on on this with the numerous departments at the city uh you know with the jamie and mike but also with streets department with the Right. Uh, with the architect and the, the stormwater and everybody else. So that it's, there's a, an evolution, but there's a lot of information available that we can provide to you. Okay. And, and Mike, I certainly appreciate your point about working together, you know, especially with the city and understanding, you know, this, this idea of a transitional lot and how it can be managed just to make sure that everybody's on the same page. We don't want people going rogue and doing different things. It'd be better to have a standard with, with the idea that whatever improvements are made uh, can be done for the best long-term interest of that property. The main uh, access points for the parking lots would be standard drive approaches per city standards. Okay. Where uh, the city actually doesn't like to have, you know, the barrier free ramps on either side of the drive approach. And so okay. that they would exist at the ramps and on the corner. So those would be standard drive approaches where you come up and then you have the flat sidewalk going across so those will be standard yeah yeah because i know that that example uh you had on on <laughs> brian avenue mike that was not accessible at all or to meet any city standards well this is uh, a step better than that so. yes yes okay. it's commissioner stamper i had a question of the applicant um i'm wondering you know mike's presentation really went a long way to helping me understand the reasons he feels uh, the near south side standards and guidelines on the right of way improvements in particular might be best postponed. And that, that certainly helped a lot. Um, I guess my question to the applicant is, I think for me, I would feel pretty comfortable uh, approving the waiver requests as requested if as a condition, the sidewalks on all frontages were completed under JPS's plan. Um, that, that to me seems like the minimum improvement that where JPS is leaving all these blocks in a better state than they're finding them and would also help, uh, I think it would help in containing the gravel uh, that gets applied to those lots as far as containing it from entering the roadway. Um, it would give you a new concrete surround that you could then develop the the gravel parking lot within does that does that make sense and is that something that jps would consider um as a condition to to this commissioner approval Stam commissioner stamper that's no issue whatsoever so what was proposed was proposed also from our consultants so i'm happy to do that it's okay. not an issue whatsoever thank you very much you bet
Any other questions of the applicant? Yeah, I, I would add, add on to uh, what Commissioner just said about that. Uh, if that were to include some of that kind of urban forestry, mm -hmm. you know, study a little bit more detail on the the trees that are being, you know, removed and all of that, which it sounds like you already started to have on the way. So. All right. Any other questions or comments from the commissioners? I guess uh, to clarify, Jamie, is there anyone else here to speak in favor or opposition to this case? Nobody online, and it looks like no one in person. Okay. All right. Then I think we can close the public portion of the hearing and open it to the commission for discussion. Um, I mean, it sounds like to me that they're, um, you know, willing to work on making these improvements and it sounds like some of it's already still underway um you know i think it would be good just to for since this is a new thing and for our benefit to understand what the what the proposal is in terms of how these you know these blocks are going to be developed for these temporary uses so uh i think it might be good to do a continuance just so that that material that's already available could be resubmitted for next month mm -hmm. would you be are you considering for lots a and b or are you just referring to cdnf uh mostly uh, cdnf yeah so it would be because e has to come back anyway yeah e so has to go through atlc right. but yeah uh, and i think that was the staff's recommendation too mm -hmm. was approval for a and b and then was it continuance I or denial for the if it's a denial without prejudice, it's effectively similar to a continuance. It just means they can come back whenever they want, but you can also continue it up, up to the commission. And it sounds like they have the answers to a lot of those questions. We just mm -hmm. haven't seen it. Right. I yeah, do agree that, that, go ahead, Jesse. Sorry. sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, th that's why I really wanted to ask the question of the of the applicant if, if they were amenable to uh, the contingency of providing sidewalk on all uh, all frontages, it, because I think for me, I just wanted to see them make the investment where it really seemed like JPS themselves was leaving the neighborhood better, and they weren't just utilizing the land they own there as a temporary way to alleviate issues on their on their campus to the south. And to me, if if they if they do that minimum improvement it actually is a substantial improvement to the pedestrian experience in the area and i i i think personally i would be fine granting the waiver with that condition uh because that that sort of meets the idea in my mind of keeping those those lots really tidy and maintained um by providing that concrete surround everyone has a sidewalk on all streets um and and I think that the interior, for me, the, the I, I expect that the plan as far as the trees and the the layout of those lots, I expect that to be done on a professional level, given who we're who we're dealing with here. Um, so I I'd be happy moving this forward today. I I can understand you know others wanting to see a little bit more of the of the documentation, but I just thought since I brought that up and and I. I, I thought I should go ahead and make a comment on where where I felt I was ready to vote today. I don't disagree. Um, I guess I would have a question to you guys about how we would work with the trees if we did if we did approve those with full sidewalks. And like you saying, given the caliber of the applicant, do we would we want a condition about trees or would we consider granting those waivers I don't think that the trees are as important to me because I think eventually when those blocks get developed the trees get removed and then they get replaced by street trees so I don't I mean that preservation of trees doesn't really hold much for me I I, I certainly trust the applicant uh, and and the near south side but since they've already said this is something that's already in process and there has just been a progress set submitted I think it wouldn't hurt to just see the, the final when it's ready. I mean, it sounds like we're running on a parallel course. Yeah, I would agree. I think for me, it's hard to wrap my, because I'm 
on you know similar to Jesse, I'm I would be prepared to you know make a vote to accept it as is. What makes it for me a little bit difficult to wrap my head around is there's a lot that I would basically be assuming to happen. Yeah. Um, and without actually seeing it, you know, there's just something, you know, more of a precedent type thing for me there. Exactly. For future developments and things like that. And I think that since this is the first one and this may be the case for this new modification exactly. of the near south side standards, it would be good just to see just that to level see of it. detail. And especially if it's already, it sounds like a lot of it has been done or is in the works of being done. We should done. be able to see it next month. Yeah. So would it be two motions? Commissioner Hook, were you going to say something? I was just going to say, I, 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 I think the good outweighs the bad here. I mean, this is a big project. It's going to be an amazing facility once they're done with it. And I think that a little leeway here to allow them some, some parking, I, it, it, it's something I would support because I think the good does definitely outweigh the bad long term. Yeah, I think after the presentations, it, it addressed some of the um, recommendations that that staff had brought up, and I think they, they were prepared and had good responses. Um, it's not as if those plans don't exist. They're, they're clearly working towards uh, rectifying those situations. Um, so with Jesse's recommendation to include the at least the sidewalks, I'd be prepared to support the, the waivers for, um, for all the lots at this point. Same here. And if there's no further discussion, I will make a motion to approve uh, the waivers as presented for lots A and B, C, D, and F, with the condition that the uh, sidewalks are installed, um, the appropriate locations for the for the temporary or transitional parking lots. The entire perimeter. Yes. Okay. And does your motion also include approval of A and B with the? Um... Completion of the sidewalks. Yes, just the sidewalks in terms of the the right of way streets, Cape standards. Uh, there's there's two parts. So there's the A and B, and then there's that little bit of gap of sidewalk there that staff wanted to make sure we included, and then there's the whole C D and F. I think if you make a motion that you're including to com a completion of the sidewalk network, it it okay. would include the okay. Yeah. okay. I would second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Chairman Grease, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Diaz? Uh, nay. Nay. Nay, okay. Commissioner Stamper? Aye. Commissioner Rattery? Aye. Commissioner Hook? Aye. Commissioner Thesman? Aye. Commissioner Hughes? Aye. Commissioner Cooper? Aye. And Commissioner Ho Harper? Aye. Motion passes 7 1. <laughs> yeah. Now we'll just make sure that Jamie knows. I'm sorry, 8 1. Chairman, I'll be recusing myself from this case as well. Okay. Yep. So we have one recusal and then um, one departure. Okay. Do you have a quorum without me? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, we're good. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. We have two, two departures. One, two, three. Yes. If we keep everybody online, we do. Who else is leaving? Okay. Commissioner Diaz. One, two, three, four. Yeah. Okay. Good to see you too. Next one. Your last case is UDC 22072. It's at 3879 Post Oak Boulevard and 13750 Trinity Boulevard. The applicant requests a certificate of appropriateness for the following a waiver from the requirement to plant street trees along Post Oak Boulevard, a waiver from the requirement to provide pedestrian scale lighting along Post Oak Boulevard, a waiver from the requirement to provide individual street-oriented entrances for the first floor units along the following streets, 
Trinity Boulevard, seven units, Candle Drive, seven units, and Post Oak Boulevard, five units. A waiver from the maximum 20 foot setback from a street or public access easement to allow 23 feet for, to allow a, set, a setback of 23 feet and six inches. This site is located in far northeast Fort Worth across from the American Airlines campus. The American Airlines campus was designed with extensive pedestrian and bicycle trails to promote better health and alternative forms of transportation to and from the campus. Bike and pedestrian connections extend to adjacent streets, including Trinity Boulevard. The proposed development provides an opportunity to provide infill development near an employment center and incremental improvements to the long-term connectivity goals for pedestrians in this area. Um, I'll go through the waiver requests one by one. Um, the first request, the residential entry waivers. The applicant has requested a waiver for meeting individual street-oriented entrances for the first floor units along three street frontages. Um, I'll note the uh, entrances being provided versus those not being provided. On Trinity Boulevard, there are 13 first floor units. Six of the units meet the code requirements. Seven of the units do not meet the code requirements. Trinity Boulevard slopes at a at about 10% from east to west, and there's a total of 21 feet of grade change along the face of the buildings that front Trinity Boulevard. There's also a gas line and a 10-foot easement along Trinity Boulevard, which runs adjacent to the building um, on that side. The recommendation for this item is that based on the constraints listed above, staff recommends approval. The Candle Drive public access easement request, there are eight first floor units in the building, um, one unit meets the code requirements, seven units do not meet the code requirements. The, aligned, the, the alignment of this drive results in a grade change of 11 feet along the face of the building. Um, this is precluding the ability to meet the code requirement for all units. So based on these constraints, staff is recommending approval of this waiver request along Candle Drive. And then on Post Oak Boulevard, there are five first floor units in the building. Um, these units, none of these units meet the code requirements. The slope here is 11.5% from north to south, and there's 11 feet of grade change along the face of the building. There's also a gas line and a 15-foot easement along Post Oak Boulevard. So based on these constraints, staff again recommends approval of this waiver request. Uh, maximum, front back setback, maximum front setback waiver recommendation, which is to Board of Adjustment. The applicant has requested a front setback waiver to increase their setback from 20 feet to 23.6 feet. This is to provide um, space for the uh, pocket park that is proposed in that location. Um, based on the plan submitted for the po pocket park, staff recommends this request. Um, finally, there is a request to waive the requirement for street trees and pedestrian lighting requirements along Post Oak Boulevard due to utility conflicts and topography. Um, despite this constraint along Post Oak Boulevard, um, staff uh, supports the request to remove those items from the right of way. However, there appears to be space outside of these easements to potentially provide these items um, behind the sidewalk on private property to accommodate those existing utilities. So um, just to summarize, staff is a requesting approval of all waiver requests with the condition that the street tree and pedestrian lights um, along Post Oak Boulevard be provided elsewhere, um, potentially behind the sidewalk line on private property. This concludes the staff report. Okay. Thank you. Yep. All right, is there anyone here to speak in favor of this case? Hi, right, Brandon Hopkins, 2726, Law of the Wood Court, Dallas, Texas, representing the developer and owner of the land, Stonehawk Capital Partners. We've done a bunch of projects in Fort Worth to date, um, one of them being uh, Bowery off of East Broadway, right next to Commissioner Stamper, some of his properties there. We're, we're actually looking at some of the street improvements that we did back in 1718 there. This is one called the Jameson over in Trinity Bluffs that's a good inspiration photo for what we're proposing here. We're under construction for the Huntley off of Weatherford Avenue as you exit the city. And then we're in uh, dirt phase, grading phase right now, right next to Top Call for another one. So love Fort Worth. Um, we um, want to bring another quality project here just south of uh, American Airlines Center. And so a couple of these waivers 
were already highlighted, mainly due to topography, easements, utilities, um, and we've gotten similar waivers with all of our projects um, and still was, were able to provide a good product here. But the, I mean, we can get into all the streets, but just wanted to point out that on Kendall Drive, we do have all of these, all of these the historic topography parks do have stoops. We're not asking for a waiver there. We're just asking for a waiver because I think we only had one stoop along the north-south one. So most of, half of Kendall Drive does comply. Um, so yeah. wanted to point that out. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the bigger one is, is right here along Post Oak where we do have about a 13% grade change. We have some standard uh, elevation shots that we can, or section views. This is uh, at, at Trinity Boulevard. This shows kind of where we have been able to provide stoops. You can see where the gas line easement runs and kind of a setback from where the, where the sidewalk is here. Um, here's another section here, the north-south section on Kendall Drive, where I think we said we just had one stoop. Was that correct on that one? Uh, for Kendall, the waiver request was eight without, one with. Is it the inverse? No, no, you're right. Yeah, one with. So okay. it's, it was tough. It's a lot of grade change there. Um, and then the easement and proximity. Um, there is a, the buildings, that main building, uh, drops and has a couple of subterranean units as well. So a lot of grade change, a lot of rock, a lot, lot of utilities. Um, and then the one that we're looking at right here, this is, this is kind of a middle ground sample of the one along Post Oak. This represents about a four foot elevation change. Um, and just for a point of reference right here, you're about 10 and a half feet from the sidewalk to the building up here, I think it's closer to two or three. So again, um, we like stoops. We try and do them as much as we can. We've done them on all of our other projects, but sometimes it's just better to maybe do a little private yard, enhanced landscape than a bunch of concrete stairs. Um, we're also contending with, even if we were to try and fit some stairs there, um, here's some elevations of the, of the actual real building we're proposing to do. Um, it's a pretty good slide here. Right here, it's just, gets real tight with that dash line, with that gas line easement. I think it's a jet, jet fuel line here, jet fuel line there. So this is really the one that we're probably least compliant with, but has the most restrictions with the biggest, the biggest uh, grade change. So I don't want to take too much more of your time, but if you have any other questions about the other specific waiver, you want to open it up. I know we're pushing towards one o'clock here. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so city staff is recommending on Post Oak that the lighting and trees go on private property. How would that be accomplished? So we looked at that um, and we can talk through it. I don't want that to be a reason to deny we're open to thoughts. You all have good ideas here. Sometimes we don't see everything, but if we look at the section view, so right here is where we could put it. And our thoughts were, we like the, the, the lights. They do provide safety for the sidewalks. It makes the property look good. We think it's a great design standard. We love it on all other deals. There's just unfortunately no room to get them close to the sidewalk. We are, we like the idea of putting, you know, down lights from the building, decor, not frog lights or emergency lights, but some decorative sconces or decorative down lights or something we haven't seen before that would put light, you know, aesthetically pleasing on the sidewalk, on the building, rather than just sticking a Washington pole light here that's going to shine light into bedroom windows and stuff. Um, so we'd be open to, you know, approval with the condition we work with staff to provide some type of sconce lighting or down lighting from the building to illuminate the path, because I think that is important. Um, we just didn't really have time to get it in this presentation. And just, okay, I understand that. I think that could be a potentially good solution. But the concept of putting trees on land you don't own, how, how would that be accomplished, Jamie? We do that, I think, through, um, we can do this through easements, I believe. So, so we, we, it's, it's, we, yeah, we put trees on in right of way and, and, and other areas all the time, but there are gas lines here and there's an easement. So we can't put large shade canopy trees. We have tried to put as many smaller ornamental trees as close to our building as possible. Rob, you may be able, our civil engineer speak to a little bit. We're not allowed to put large oaks or elms or any kind of, so safety issues, design issues with 
putting over the jet fuel lines that are right there in the easement. And there's a, a water line and a sewer line, I think. Or maybe just a water line there as well. Oh, so those two two circles represent the water and sewer? Uh, water and, yeah. 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 yeah, and then this is the utility. Oh. Right here. Just... So the utilities aren't in the easement? Right now, that's, that's where they're depicted. You know, that, that gas line may be in the wrong spot. Apologies, it's probably in the, it's, it's in the utility easement, the water lines outside of the utility easement in the right of way. Okay. No, it was, it was drawn by, it was drawn by a landscaper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if we, if, we, if we flip through, oh wait. So, oh. dash line is that utility easement where you got the jet fuel line that runs up here. Water sewer line there, that's all public. So I think that sorry, mistake there on the on where it was shown. Okay. So then the sidewalk is adjacent to the, the roadway and it's outside of the easement. Correct. It's outside of the easement. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, I mean, I think that makes sense to me, and I I like the suggestion of building mounted lighting to help enhance that experience. Is it is it a very pedestrian friendly road, Post Oak, in that stretch? No, but it. I mean, we were really we worked with Mike Brennan in the past when we first started developing here in sixteen and seventeen, and sidewalks and trees are expensive, but we've seen the value time and time again. So even though we don't think it's going to be that pedestrian today in 20 years, who knows, but mm -hmm. even day one, everyone else is being required to do it. It makes it look good. So we're on board now after six years of just, it looks good. Let's do it. I just uh, want to make one really quick note. In the past when we, we've always required sidewalks, but not always street trees and pedestrian lights. The trade-off was removing a between a 10% and 20% open space requirement that developers would have met, had to meet. And over the years, we have removed those. In return, we just asked for street trees and, and lights. There's no doubt it's expensive. Once again, the sidewalk's required. So really, street trees are required in most places. So really what you're looking at is the lighting. Mm -hmm. So I just want to clarify that for everyone. Okay. That that there was a trade. Okay. And so uh, on a lot, if you have MU, you are, many of our form-based districts, there is no open space requirement. Okay. So before it was 20% and 10%, depending on what you add. So if we rewind the development clock and we go back to 2000 somewhere in that area you would have been looking at reserving 20 percent of your property for open space oh i see but by see having I mean? this set back now you don't they, have to right. you can do a hundred percent developable in return we get street lights if Does you guys yeah sense? if you guys want me to put street lights no no, no we'll, i'm not yeah. i'm not i'm not this has uh, nothing to do with your project. Got it. Okay. Uh, per se. You had just made the comment that it was expensive. I'm just making the comment from the public side that there was a trade off. I got it. Yeah. And yours was. I think it's. Deal. I mean, it was. Yeah. It was just hard for us to stomach first, but we. Sure. I was complimenting that we see the value, I guess. No, right. no, no. Yeah, okay. No, for sure. And I'm just clarifying for everyone that got there it. was I a trade. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I, I guess question back to staff: Are you comfortable with the idea of, of building mounted lighting? As yeah, if there's lighting being provided as an element, it can be an alternate form if it's okay. doing its job. And then the with the room available, planting some other more decorative trees mm -hmm. closer to the building. Okay, yeah. So you'd support this then? All right. Sounds good. Um, 
Any other questions of the applicant from the commissioners? Okay. All right. Is there anybody else here to speak in favor of opposition? <clears throat> All right. We'll close the public portion and open it to the commission. Sounds like, um, you know, this developers work with the staff and they've, you know, made the best attempt at meeting all of the requirements. There's obviously a couple that, that don't work, but they're able to, to mitigate with some building mounted lighting. I think if, yeah, if a motion is made, I'll just maybe include that, that building mounted lighting be providing and the details be worked out with staff. This is Commissioner Hughes. I'd like to make a motion to approve with the contingency that lighting on the building would be provided and decorative trees outside the easement closer to the building would be provided. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. A motion and a second. Chairman Grease, how do you vote? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Stamper? Aye. Commissioner Rattery? Aye. Commissioner Hook? Aye. Commissioner Thesman? Aye. Is that everybody who's left? One, two, three, four, yep. five. Six. Oh, and Commissioner Hughes. Aye. <laughs> Motion passes 6 0. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next month. I was quite excited.